If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode of Mind Pump. You know what? It, it We did not intend for this to be like a, a super commercial with because this is not how this works where we talk about four or five people, but we were just having conversation. Yeah, conversation just came out yeah. in the conversation. So we do a 47-minute intro. Uh, this is before we get to the fitness stuff. We start out by talking about online bullies. We talk about Justin's Butcher Box Instagram story, probably the best story anyone's ever done Ever yes. in the history of Instagram. <laughs> uh, they are one of our sponsors. If you go to butcherbox.com forward slash mind pump, you will get, ready for this, free bacon forever. What? Yeah, free bacon for life, plus $10 off your first order and free shipping. Is that like a weird strategy, like to get people to sign up, but then knowing <sighs> if they ate bacon like crazy because it's unlimited they to die. them, they die? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> They calculate that in. <laughs> they Free it. cigarettes for life. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> no, bacon's this actually their their bacon quality is so good and it's uh, minimally processed, so it's the healthiest bacon. No, this is true. You'll find if you. Oh, we also mentioned Thrive Market versus Whole Foods, and Adam discovered that Thrive Market sells pet I food. I did not know. This just goes to show you too how this was again not a planned commercial whatsoever. We were just talking about. I don't know how we got into feeding. eliminating middlemen. Yeah. Oh yeah, eliminating middlemen, and then how great that is. You talked about Thrive and how great they were, and then somehow, oh, I was talking because I just bought dog food yesterday from Petco, and they have the thing for you know Petco delivery, and I'm like, why am I still picking this up? And then Doug all of a sudden pulls up on the screen. What an asshole I am! I had no idea that Thrive Market, which I already order from every single month, could be shipping me my dog food. I'm That's right. Stupid. And now we got a hookup for you with them. If you go to thrivemarket.com forward slash mind pump. You will get one month free, $20 off three orders of $49 or more, and free shipping. Then we talked about our testosterone test that we just did through Everly Well um, and how mine was the highest. No surprise. <laughs> You're the winner. <laughs> but we also talk about we're going to go on some testosterone boosting protocols, and then we're going to do more tests to see how what we're doing affects our testosterone levels. Last one, Everly Well uh, is one of our sponsors. If you go to everlywell.com, enter the code MINDPUMP, you get 15% off any test. Part of the testosterone boosting protocol was Adam using the Juve Red Light. You can go to joovv.com forward slash MINDPUMP and get a discount on their red light therapy. And finally, we talked about the value of talk therapy. That was something personal for me. Then we get into the questions. The first question was, is there any reason to even attempt a one rep max? Hmm. And if so, what is the best way about going about it? So should you test out your strength? Should you do that? And if we do think you should do that, how should you do that? Hopefully we don't piss off all the CrossFitters. That's right. Next question was, are thoughts on childhood obesity and what may be causing it? Definitely an epidemic, definitely a scary epidemic. Trigger one that, warning. One that may actually bankrupt us if we don't solve it. So we speculate as to why we think that issue is happening. The next question was, do we have any regrets at all? Great discussion this part of the episode. Finally, what are the top three books that each of us have decided have impacted our lives the most? Uh, we all mentioned books that we think were important for our development. And we also mentioned, or at least I mentioned some YouTube videos that I watched that really uh, changed my paradigm or at least got me to think a little bit differently. Also, it's important to note this month, Maps Anywhere is half off. Maps Anywhere is our maps program that requires almost no equipment. All you need is bands, resistance bands, and a stick. That's it. Resistance bands and a stick. You can do these workouts anywhere. Super effective. The program is now half off, so you save 50% off the price. We also have other maps programs for other types of goals. Uh, and we have bundles that put some of these programs together for for specific types of adaptations or goals. For example, our super bundle is designed for people who want it all set up for them. It's designed for people who are like, look, I want to get started. I want to get fit. I want to get in shape. I want everything I need to do this. The super bundle does that for you. It's one year of exercise programming. It's also discounted off of the retail price of just buying all these programs individually by almost, or over, I should say, 30%. You can find all of those programs at mindpumpmedia.com. I think Mind Pump has officially arrived. What happened? Whoa. So 
the, I, and I, I used to always think this was really strange about our business that we really don't receive a lot of hate. And I used to think it was because... Oh, is it because we're getting hella hate? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yes, finally. Well, yeah. I mean, like, for example, like we, you just did an incredible back-to-back videos on YouTube. You did a great video on split. You did an incredible, like, body part split versus, like, a, you know, full body workout routines that just went live a day ago. And you just did a killer one on protein. Both are just, were just great videos. You know, there's very few videos that we do that I turn around and watch again. And, like, I watched it in enjoyed it because the information you provided was so valuable and you could see how comfortable you are with now talking on the just one camera which I know how weird that is so but and then I read other comments and you know it's like a 50 50 split like it's such a great video that there's always going to be people that are like oh my god that was awesome they share it but then there's just people that are just straight hating and trolling you know what I'm saying like, have no idea who you are talking shit and like even the stuff they're talking shit about it's just like oh this is hilarious like you obviously don't know, know. who Sal is or who mind pump is whatsoever but it, we've gotten to that large of a scale now that a video goes out and it instantly sees seven to 10,000 people. And it's inevitable seven to 10,000 because it's being shared and it's being put on, it's being, you know, recommended on other pages and shit like that. So we're definitely Plus, attracting. you know, here's the thing. If you say things that matter, okay, you're going to get uh, uh, people pushing back. Mm -hmm. If you never say anything that matters, you'll never get pushback. So it's just the reality. Now, of course, you get tons of hate. That's... <laughs> That's different. It could be a signal that you're maybe an asshole or whatever. Right, right. But if you say things that really, really matter, then you're going to start some some conversations, and there's right. going to be people who are going to disagree with you, and that's well, that's I, okay. And I, YouTube is like people used to always say that we you go, oh you'll see when you guys you, you guys will get all this, and I'm like man I'm really surprised because the business yeah. is running and we're doing well and all these things are going great, and I really uh -huh. feel like we've been well received and we get a lot of great reviews, and you know I, I really didn't feel like we ever get any hate, but. And and you and maybe it's YouTube too. Like YouTube is just the the, the people on YouTube are are different it's than like, podcast oh, people. Yeah. yeah, it's like a cesspool of of <laughs> hatred. Bro, you go through some videos on YouTube. I've seen the most racist, sexist, terrible shit that no one would say in public, ever. Yeah, and I see it in the comments on YouTube. And I don't know if it's because it's super anonymous, yeah. or because it draws that kind of crowd. It's a lot of the same thing. Like you see with online gaming. You know, there's a lot of that too. Where I don't know. It still exists. Like people just like talk shit and say racist stuff because they feel just like I don't know. They get they get something from it. Like they're they're anonymous and they can get away with it and they can say all this shit. Well, you could argue it's another not it's, check them on it's it. It's a type of bullying, right? Yeah, it's a type of bullying that totally. people are doing and that they can get away with. And I wouldn't be surprised if most of the people on the other side of that are a bunch of little weasels. That oh, totally. In, in real life, they could never bully somebody, which is kind of funny, right? That like where we're at time. now. So we, we're all this anti-bullying stuff going on, but in reality, we're we're probably bullying people more now because of the ability to do it virtually. Because now, guys that are because in when we grew up in school, the bully was like. 100 pounds 50 to 100 pounds bigger than you like he just you know he hit he hit puberty two years before and you. he ran the risk if he bullied someone there was always the risk that someone may fight back right mm -hmm. but when you're online yeah, you anonymously checked. there is no there is no fight back there is no risk of that right. so you have a bunch and of you don't have to be big and tough mm -hmm. <laughs> you know yeah. what i'm saying which or smart yeah <laughs> right so that that's a just, lot like road rage yeah like somebody talks all oh, the shit so and they drive the off you know like have you ever had to? Have you ever checked someone in 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 a road rage road rage incident and yeah. seen the switch yeah. happen so quickly? Oh yes, yeah. yeah. Oh, I had a guy yell at me once, and he was oh, cussing and get out of your car, whatever. All I did was open my door, and he took off. Yeah, because you saw me start to come like, out of the oh, car. Oh yeah. shit! Yeah. Oh, my, I'm, I'm just here. kidding. <laughs> and he drives away. Dude, nothing yeah. is, I, and I try and tell people this all the time. Nothing is scarier when in a situation like that where someone's screaming, yelling, acting all crazy. Than being the calm motherfucker who just walks right up. That's <laughs> right, it, man. Ready to get thrown Let's down. Let's dance. Nine times out of ten, <laughs> dude. I'm telling you, more than nine times out of ten, almost every time. It's very rare. I'm trying to think of a time where I walked up on somebody like that and then we went we went after it. Most people that are screaming, acting all crazy. It's all you, front. When you walk up real yeah. calm uh -huh. and say, ask them if this is what they want to do. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> most, most of them are like, uh, uh you know, really. hey, man. Hey, man. I was you know, kidding. They, I was yeah, kidding. they like that. Hey man, will you come on, man? Yeah. Are you sure? Are you, so, so you want to fight right now? Because we can, you know. No, yeah. no, 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 no. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny because uh, you see this sometimes with with girls, women in particular, where they'll they'll cuss and scream and say stuff because they know that 
there's not going to be any physical recourse. Yeah, right. And so you'll see this sometimes when there's a girl with her boyfriend. You ever seen this at a bar <laughs> <Bro>. <laughs> where the girl's talking shit to the another hype. guy because yeah. her boyfriend is there yeah. and she knows she hypes up her boyfriend. And you can see time. the look on the Dude, dude's I face talk- where the guy's like, the boyfriend's yeah. like, listen, you need to shut up because yeah, yeah. I'm the one that's going to have to fight. Bro, the best, yeah, one of my down. favorite intros to a movie I shared with you just recently, The Way of the Gun. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah where the girl's like that. running her mouth like crazy and it's, it's like a fu- 10 minute scene and you just think that it's going to be this big brawl and then Benicio Del Toro just straight open hand slaps the chick. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, you know, I'm sitting here complimenting Sal on how, how great of a video. I feel uh, obligated to compliment you too, Justin. I think... <laughs> <laughs> That's, uh, this compliment means you're obligated. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, because I had thought about it and I hadn't said anything to you. I think you have done the best uh, commercial slash Instagram story than anybody else, and it was for Butcher Box. Oh my god, that was so funny with the bacon yeah. that you did. I thought that was so clever. How long did that take you to Thanks. do that? Um, it, not long. I mean, it was just one of those things. It's for me, it sucks because a lot of times I get random ideas, and then I'm like, oh, this is kind of a good idea. Maybe I'll go with this and. Um, I've been trying a lot to think in terms of stories because that wasn't one of those things. You know, when you try something for a long time and then all of a sudden finally it clicks, I'm like, oh, this is how people, you know, view stories and they want to actually like, okay, story. this part, this part. Yeah. And you line it up. And so now my brain's starting to kind of click in that direction. So yeah, I was, I was happy that one was received. That's well. right. You know, we, it's been a while. We, we, we pride ourselves on being very open about our business and sharing things like that. I think that's a really important important thing for somebody else that's trying to to build their business to understand like how you how to utilize Instagram stories correctly. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Taylor out of all of us is probably the best. I think uh, yep. each of us are, have evolved and, and gotten better You're at taking it. Taking a lot from him, yeah. Right. And you know, not a lot of people know that when you I see this all the time on people's Instagrams where they, you know, they're trying to sell their shirt or their supplements, drive here for a coupon mm-hmm. like what a lot of kids don't know that are watching that and they're emulating that is that that gets like no clicks. Like you're not making. If I put up, a, which is why you don't ever see that on yeah, my. Click here. This is my sponsor. Yeah, buy that or get twenty percent off these supplements. Like nobody yeah. buys that shit. Nobody clicks on that. Nobody is making no. any money on that. No. And even if you've got millions of followers, you may get a half a percent of people doing that, and that might seem like a little bit of money to you, but that's terrible. It's mm-hmm. so not uh, valuable. Yeah. But if you actually put together a story that leads to something, um, you you'll drive. A significant amount more people to the to the actual link. How, how yeah, often are you difference. doing? How often are you doing the the butcher box? Are you monthly or every other month? Yeah, I do every other month. Yeah. Um, because we end up. I mean, we we eat a lot of meat, you know, to begin with. But uh, it's usually just for dinner, so it's not like I'm using that for lunch mm-hmm. and breakfast mm-hmm. and all that. Like. Um, so yeah, we usually kind of, I mean, it, it, it lasts for quite it's a while. It's such so, a brilliant thing that they yeah. did by doing I'm it. glad they did that. They, it's, it goes either every month, every other month, or every three months, yep, right? Yep. And it's frozen, so it lasts forever. Right. I, yeah. I went, so I actually bought some grass-fed meat at Whole Foods the other day, which is more expensive, and it doesn't taste as good. Yeah. Grass-fed meat, you, I mean, look, here's the deal. Grass-fed meat, healthier for you. But I'm going to also be honest and say, it's tough. grain-fed meat. Tastes better a lot of times. Yeah, because yeah. gra- grass-fed meat sometimes has that gaminess to it, or it doesn't taste as I don't know, it doesn't have as much marbling or whatever, which is what I like. The reality of it is, the but- it, the- it tastes how it's probably supposed to taste. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> you know but now that I know the difference, right. you know what I'm saying? Right, right. But the butcher box stuff is fucking good. If I didn't know it was grass-fed, I would. I don't it's think I would have guessed it. It's the best grass-fed yeah. I've ever had, hands down. Yeah. It's not yeah. even close because I don't. And I, even then, like if you compare it to you know, one that's been grain fed, it's you're it's gonna taste better. Like it's, it's, there's yeah. more fat in it, more marble. Yeah. What's the what's the cut that they it's like a tri tip, but they don't call it a tri tip. Yeah. Yeah, it's a steak. It's like a um Is it sirloin, sirloin tip? Sirloin tip, yeah. Sirloin is that what it is? Steak, yeah. Something like that. Yeah. What's up, Doug? I think it's sirloin cap. Is that what oh yeah, 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 yeah. There you go. Really good. Yeah. No, that's my favorite one actually out of, out of the group. And I do I do make quite a bit of burger meat and stuff like that like they have the patties too. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, the bacon. <laughs> I was like highlighting that primarily in the story, but I was like so stoked cuz like literally my two boys eat so much fucking bacon like we fight over it. <laughs> so, I was really happy about that deal that they had going on. Well, well, it's it's this this whole model of Thrive Market does the same thing where they they'll take products Deliver them directly to your door. And what people don't realize is there's a lot of cost involved every time you have to include a new step in the distribution, producing and distribution process, right? 
And with grocery stores, you have a lot of middlemen. You know, you're, it's not as direct like like it is with these these dudes. These, so many. You have someone that has to drive it there in the truck. You have someone that has to unload it, and then in they there. have to they sell have it. Somebody that has to put it in the shelves. Mm-hmm. Then you have somebody that has to scan it at the register, and then they have to sell it for a higher price yeah, in order then, to make their own. Then profit. you also got to pay for the place. That's I mean the, the the land. Oh man, it's a. That's what I'm saying. So so you have like Thrive Markets, another good example. That's why they're going to put everybody out of business. Oh dude, dude. I mean, yeah. stores know, like that. In have the you future? calculated that the the savings? Yeah, yeah. It's ridiculous. It's it's like half. No, it's a big savings. I I used to just go to Whole Foods, and I'm one of like I'll be I'll admit I'm one of those people that sometimes doesn't even look at the price. I just buy it because, you know, quality of food is so important to me that I'm willing to spend a lot on it. I, I am, I'm, or, or a lot more than I guess most people, because it's it's important. But uh, when I do the saving, when I calculate the savings, when I go to Thrive Market versus Whole Foods, it's like it's insane. It's like 25 to 50 percent lower on shit that I'm going to buy anyway. Yeah. And it's so convenient because I'm trying to get to a point where I have all my stuff like that. The la- I have to. In fact, I just picked up the dog for the other day. And I'm like, why am I still doing this? Because Petco does it. So there's a, all these wags and I forget all these other companies that do this, that I can get my dog food literally delivered to my doorstep on a certain day every single month or every other month, however I want to set it up. And the irony in all of this is that I just been too so lazy to get it set up. Mm-hmm. But it's like I need to because it, make, it frustrates me every time that I have to go to the store because I'm like. I I have to go out of my it's way. It's always a last minute thing. It right? is a last minute. I'm like, yeah. wait till the dog food's out. I'm like, ah, fuck! I gotta get the yeah. boys some more food. Oh, there you go. There's some good ones up there. There's some some grain free oh, dog shit. food. Thrive and... does dog food. I know. Yeah, Thrive Market's That's so got... rad. I'm gonna have I to didn't take know. advantage of that too. Are you kidding me, Doug? Yeah. No, oh, I feel like go. such an asshole right I now. I, I actually I didn't know that either. And it's all what? it's all like non-GMO. You can buy lots of organic what? dog food. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Go back up right there. I think that's my dog food. Which one? The brown one. What, what, Organics, what? organic chicken and oatmeal dog food recipe. Then they have the wet dog food too, because you mix it, don't you? No, I do half and well. When half I say and half, half and half, I don't literally mix it together. I like one. They eat twice a day. One meal I normally do is like a raw chicken. I do like these and these patties that I get. But wow, it is good to see that that animal food, pet food, is is the quality of that now has gone up. Well, I know. so let me tell you, that I because I can't think of I anything believe, more processed than I, dog food. I oh, believe dude. that anybody who's listening to this right now that is involved in anything to do with that world, it's a very smart trend to get on right now because the the animals are behind the humans. Like we're we're starting to figure that out. We see how huge organic is going with. With humans, but the way that we treat our our pets is is, is and we've watched this evolve in our time. Like we now treat them like humans. Like yeah. everyone treats them like humans. So well, why would because, we not? I mean, it's expensive taking them to the vet, and it's like we could put all these preventative practices in place, just like we would for ourselves to keep them, you know, healthy and and cancer free. And you well, know, it's just like and when you look at when you look at all the things that we talk about in humans, the rise of like autoimmune, the rise of obesity, the rise of diabetes, the rise of all these things. Yeah, our pets been coming with us yes the pets are on the same exact slope so you're gonna see the pendulum swing back and we kind of see it a little bit but there's still room for people i think to get into this space and make really good money because i think this is going to be the future is definitely like the next trend yes Yes. i wonder what how many dude i can't believe they sell dogs i feel like do we know do we know what i don't know if you can find this doug what percentage of pets are now on medication because I, i i'm I would assume it's exploded, and this is my own anecdote, but almost everybody I know who's had a dog for a long time, their dog has died of cancer. It's like super common. Very common. It's it's That's what I'm saying. It's very, and the stuff that they get, I like. I hear these people doing, and I look at their dogs, and I'm like, dude, this is crazy. I had this conversation with Katrina, uh, because people that see the bulldogs, they always want to feed them more, give them, I'm like, they're not allowed, first of all, they don't eat table food at all, no human food. You know, other than like raw chicken or steak or whatever stuff like that that I'm giving them, but these guys literally they'll just keep eating if you keep feeding them. <laughs> That's cute though. Yeah, they'll they will and they'll get just they'll get so fat and they'll and then they their lifespan is only like seven years and and like half the reason why that is is there is because people are overfeeding them. Yeah. Well, well, yeah. I, I want to know what that number is because I'd love to look up and see because if. If their if their health is starting to get really really bad, I mean, there's there's something definitely going on. Dude, it is. I've seen I've seen the charts before. Have you? Yeah, I no, mean, no. That's yeah. why I'm talking about this. This is why I think it's a smart space. When I was a kid, I people, even thought it was crazy. People just aren't talking about it very much. Yeah. We're, yeah. we're we're still people are still coming around to the organic thing with humans. Yeah. yeah. I mean, even we, when I when I was a kid, I thought it was weird. I remember you know we had a dog, and I remember looking at like 
The do- all the dog ever eats is the same. Is the same thing. Dog food, it's hard dog food, and and it, it's super fake. Like, aren't these? Didn't they evolve from wolves? Why are we giving them? <laughs> yeah, why are, why we, are we giving them like cereal? Yeah, they're eating yeah. like imagine if steak imagine and... if all you ever ate was Cheerios. You know what I mean? Someone <laughs> just poured dry Cheerios in your bowl. Here you go. Here's your meal. You know what I mean? Mm. And then you get cancer. Like that's weird. Yeah, well, how, <laughs> how did that happen? How did he get cancer? Well, yeah, why you know are all I mean? these lumps all over him? Here? God damn it. Anyway, yeah. that's crazy. No luck, Doug, huh? No. Oh, but wow. There, there, there might not be statistics for no, it. No, no, no. I've seen this you before. Have? Yeah, I'll look for it later yeah, on. Yeah. I'll check it well, out. Well, now you know. They've got the wet and the dry, the dry dog food. Although, yeah. you know, saying wet dog food, that sounds kind of gross, doesn't it? <laughs> Doug, I see a bunch of one and a half pound, two, which is nothing. I need like a 20 pound, 30 pound bag. Did you see any big bags? Oh, there's a 13 pounder. Yeah. 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 It's, there you go. There's a 13 pounder right there too. Yeah, it's a decent size. Yeah. Good deal. I can't believe I didn't know this though. On Thrive, what does Thrive not have? Maybe I should start thinking like yeah. that. What am I? What am I ordering from somewhere else that I could be just having shit to my house yeah. without my other stuff with Thrive? Well, they have they have um, they have household like home improvement. Yeah, stuff. they have cleaning like, what? cleaning supplies. They have which we know that we know that yeah. Yeah, the cleaning cleaning supplies. Sal Suds, my favorite thing. Doug, you got to order some more <laughs> of that. Have you guys tried the Sal Suds? No. I'm not saying that just because it's I'm named not after saying me. It. It's a good product. <laughs> yes. I'm not saying because they're fans of mine. It's got a great brand. Yeah. They named it after me. Yeah. It literally is a good soap. Yeah. It works really, really well. Well, I think I, I think Justin wins the award for the the best uh, Instagram commercial though. That's the the moral, Boom. moral of this. Sal's yeah, winning the it. YouTube doing uh, as far as the best YouTube. Sal Justin wins. the best in story. Yeah. You know what? I, you know I'm what? Kind of sucking at everything. Right now. Hey, <laughs> Doug, did you're, you're the intro guy, man. Doug, did you mail in your testosterone? Did you mail in your testosterone kit? I yet? didn't yet. Okay, I need to do that. Yeah, I want to see what's going on there because what I want to try with everybody is to we'll do some kind of a protocol. I've already got one. I've already started. And I'm not sharing it. Oh, really? Not yet. I, I think it would be cool for all of us to share it. So, oh, you- I was gonna wait. Why? Oh. Yeah, like I'm like formulating it myself. Like I'm mm. like trying. Because you're competitive. Definitely. I am competitive. <laughs> I want you to do your protocol, do my protocol. Justin does his yeah. protocol. We'll see what's up. We'll see okay. what what time it is in in another in another month or two. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I just wanted to implement one thing so we could tease out what those impacts are, rather than doing a whole. Okay. Bunch well, of what that. I'm open to to discuss with you is I'm open to us. Because I don't know about just one thing. I want to do like one or two things. I think one is like too small of a variable. Well, I'm not going to help you now. (laughs) I don't need your help. (laughs) What I think we should do is like maybe you pick two. Like I know you already like the four sigmatic cordyceps and those types of things like that. And I think maybe... You do that and something else. No, there's a, there's already one thing I'm I'm already doing. And I've got the Juve Light, and I love using. I probably use. The, I know, not probably. I for sure use our sauna and Juve Light more than anybody. You're gonna else. blast the Tezzies? Yeah, so, right on the Tezzies. So right I'm, on the, I'm gonna do right on the goods because I was doing that anyways, like pretty consistently. But then I laid off before the test. I'm just gonna jerk off more. <laughs> That's all you're gonna do. More, more. <laughs> That's a lot, Justin. Hey. I got to get those numbers up. You know, your number will actually go up, and I'm helping you out, okay? So I'm not, I'm not listen, here's the deal. I don't have a scarcity <laughs> mindset. Yeah. Your test goes not up. Because you're, my, you're already, that's because you're already crushing us. Not, yeah. Well, yeah. So here's here's what I was thinking is, uh, ju- well, not thinking. This is what you can do in, in that regard, Justin. Don't jerk off. Mm. Don't do anything oh, for, hold it in. for a week. Because mm. within a week, like one to two week period, that does cause a spike in testosterone. Right. Yeah. But I don't know if that's it's a permanent easy. one. Here's what I'm doing, because I do know that study that, and this is pretty established that if you go really, really low carbohydrate for long, long periods of time, it will lower uh, testosterone. Hmm. Now I don't, it's not, I don't know if it lowers it a lot, but studies will show that it does lower it. So now I've been eating starches. My gut health is really good. I don't eat a ton, but I am eating more. Um, so I'm wondering if if my what my numbers are going to look like just from that to yeah. see what that goes up to. My goal is to go over the. I want to see if I can get my number outside of range. Yeah. You know what I mean? Whoa! Yeah. Well, I'm gonna be oh, doing somebody that did. and getting sleep. I meant to ask you this. I so, saw it, the kid. Yeah, yeah. His numbers were out of range too. Wow. Yeah, which made me feel worse. I know. Well, he's he he was scared. I was like scared. I'm like that's awesome. I'm jealous. Yeah. Well, his estradiol was wasn't I, a little I, high. He thought it was too high, but I'm like, no, it's not high. It's in, within range. His estra, estradiol, whatever. Um, I don't know. I, I, I want to see if I can get mine out of range, which the range they had was up to 186, I think it was, right? Yeah. And that was 112, I think. That's a, that's some high standards, bro. Yeah. I think I can I think I can get You're mine. Charging it up. It's totally feasible. I got no, nowhere to go but up, so I'm okay with whatever you imagine, I you imagine it goes down. <laughs> yeah, <I was> so, <laughs> oh, God. I would fucking... Uh, 
I'll go crawl in a Justin corner. was angry about that. I was angry about it. He doesn't like losing. No. <laughs> he's like, I don't like it. Especially to the guy that has like hormone on the problems. Bottom, <laughs> bottom of the totem pole. You know what I mean? Oh. <laughs> Some bullshit. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna lie, dude. I felt really good about beating you. <laughs> I know you did, you Cause asshole. Because I was just like, and it's less about like beating you, it's just more like, I don't, oh my god, yeah, like, I don't, wow, that's like, weird. Like, yeah. I, I've been like, I've been so hard on myself on how horrible my hormone yeah. levels are, and, and so, then I was like, wow, this, this explains things for me, you know. Like I was using it more to interpret like how I've, you know, internally been feeling like this fight to like get shit done and dude, do things in the weight room. It's just been a isn't fucking that, struggle. Isn't that interesting? Like. It's, you know, being somebody who has in the last five years, I mean, I I don't know. Well, personally, I don't know too many people that are friends of mine that have experienced as dramatic of swings of hormones as I have in the mm-hmm. last five years. And there's definitely this really, you know, when I when being low, uh, man, it's a it's a fucking place to be. Mm-hmm. I, I have so much empathy now for. Women that go through menopause or women that are on their period at times or guys that are getting older that just have really stressful jobs, don't get a lot of sleep, don't even realize that they probably have low low hormones because they don't ever get it tested. Like it, it's like this hormones drive emotion, they drive dude. feeling, they drive uh, they drive sometimes perception. Like yeah. Justin said, I uh, what I find the hardest is a guy who has so much passion and love for training like I do. Mm-hmm. I just I love to train, man. And it was it was hard. It for, sucks when it, you very very hard yeah. to muster up the energy. Imagine if I mean for people listening who don't know what that feels like. Imagine working out and every workout feels like it sucks. Yeah, that's what literally what this it was. Like. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, and it's compounding on, on many levels, right? Because it it sucks because your your strength isn't there. It sucks because your in, energy isn't there. Your 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 drive your drive to do it isn't there. Mm-hmm. The results are terrible. Mm-hmm. I mean, when you have low testosterone in you, low testosterone versus yeah, mid gaming. to high, oh, huge difference. Yeah, I mean, I already feel like the the way my body is responding now, like I'm I'm not putting in that much more work today than I was just two months ago. But now it's responding. It's just that my body, my hormone levels are finally starting to recover a little bit. And so now my body's yeah. starting to respond, which then that compounds because it gives me a little more motivation. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, oh, this is awesome. I can actually look in the mirror now and see that the the sacrifices I was making nutritionally and the hard work I was putting in the gym is actually changing in my body a little well, bit. Well, <laughs> it's going to be, I tell you yeah. what, I don't know if I want to see Justin with higher testosterone. Cause That's exactly what my wife said. Yeah. <laughs> he's kind of, he's she's all, like worried, you know, she's like, no, I, you're so nice and like <laughs> thoughtful. And, <laughs> like you're going to turn into an asshole or something. Did you start like, crying? What are you talking about? <laughs> Yeah, made you cry. You're like, thank no. you, honey. <laughs> <laughs> it is a little. Let's hug. It is a little weird, though, that that is the one thing too that I noticed that I think is the positive side of all that is it did make me very, um, I don't know what the word is that I'm looking empathetic. For. Yeah, maybe empathetic. you know what though. Like, so I'm here's just- a, so here's the thing that, uh, about that. It's not that testosterone causes you to want to be an asshole and all that stuff. That's not the, that's not what it is. No. Here's what I think it, because. The reality is that the studies will show that low testosterone also causes irritability, yes. uh, anger, all that stuff. Because what I think it is, is because I know for me, when I feel shitty, you just feel shitty. When I don't feel good, it makes, I almost feel empathetic to other people because I don't feel good. So it's like, you know what I mean? So it's almost like I feel bad for my girl or whatever. Like, look, I don't feel good. Look, I'm sorry or whatever. Or if she doesn't feel good, I'm more empathetic to it. I think that's what it is. Because if you an, always feel- that's an interesting perspective. I I could I could get on board with that yeah. because you're right. Like I, I could I remember myself kind of processing like that sometimes where, you know, I feel down and sorry for myself and this and that. Where and you and you almost like you almost want to kind of like tell them like, look, I'm sorry. You know, oh, I you would. Know. I would even communicate See? that. I would tell Katrina. I would say, hey, I just want you to know, like, I'm just. I'm not feeling myself today and I'm just, I feel like unmotivated and tired. And mm-hmm. so if I feel short or irritable, let me know. But the fact that I, I have that ability to communicate that mm-hmm. and say that makes me seem like I'm more empathetic and that. Yeah, because just- low testosterone it, it, by itself will make a guy more irritable, angry, depressed. And when you look at studies on men who get testosterone replacement therapy, who need it, who actually need it, they'll say they feel more confident, they feel more energetic, they're happier. They're you know more connected to people, so it's not that testosterone is this poison that oh if it's low I'm this better person. That's not the case. I really uh, think that this is an important thing that everybody over the age of thirty does. Test it. 
I, I think people under the age of thirty. You know why? Well, yes. Because I think they should find out what their what their well, good what, hormone that's, levels that's are. That's what our, my original hormone therapist said was, you know, and that's kind of what led me yet. Because you need to 30. know what your normal. That's is. That's what he said. That's mm-hmm. what he, he said. Before thirty, you should at least test it one time so you can kind of see where you're mm-hmm. at. And then after thirty, I think it's highly- see because I know me. I know me, and although my number put me right in the middle of that range. I know that it's low for me, be based off of how I feel, because well, I know what so I me, normally feel so like. So me too. Like I'm, I'm in the you know quote unquote normal range right now, but I, I definitely don't feel the best me. Yeah. I, I know what the best mm-hmm. you know healthy version of me feels like, but I at least feel better. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's, it's funny too because I told I told Jessica I'm like yeah I'm gonna I'm gonna I think because I've gone low carb for so long because I've been trying to heal my gut, which let's be honest. If you're trying to heal your gut, that if you have unhealthy gut or you have inflammation, that's going to affect your testosterone more than the fact that you're not eating carbohydrates. So I think, though, though that because now that my gut is so much healthier due to some of the fasting protocols and stuff like that that I've been doing, that now I can introduce those starches again and they seem to be okay with me, I think my testosterone levels are going to get higher. So I was telling her this and she's like, oh, shit. She's like, it gets... You're going to get higher testosterone because I, and I'm trying to explain to her like how, how you know me now, however high my libido is now and that kind of stuff. Trust me, it's normally a lot high. Like when I'm, when I'm, when I'm fully on with, when I know my testosterone levels are where they're normally at, I have an extremely high libido. So even though it's now in the mid range, this for me feels like it's low. That's why I want to see what will happen. I want to see if I'm able to get it even higher. Well, that's originally how I was able to even get on hormone replacement therapy is I technically wasn't in like a dangerously low where some doctors, some, some doctors are different. Like some of them will tell you like, you know, Oh, you're, you're fine. You Mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? You're not dangerously low or it's not going to be bad or unhealthy for you. And so they're like, you're, they don't prescribe it. But if you're towards the bottom of the normal range or right on the cusp or like that, some doctors will be like, and you're only 30 something years old and you're a guy like me who exercises. That's how my guy looked like. Mm-hmm. You exercise, you do all these things like you should be higher than that. Mm-hmm. And, I'm, and if I'm telling him, giving him feedback, I don't feel right. Mm-hmm. You know, then he's like, OK, yeah, you pro- you're probably used to being more closer to the 900 range and you're measuring at 250, which is extremely low for a guy like I mean, it's, Right, right. You know, yeah, you're. Less- and some hormone replacement uh, specialists will say that the higher end is where men should be. I don't know if I buy that though. It's almost like a doctor who's trying to prescribe cholesterol medicine telling you your cholesterol has to be super low. I feel that's why it's hard for me to believe because I think it has to be based off of your your own subjective perception because when they say when you have hormone replacement specialists saying, "Oh no, they needs to be this high." It's almost like they're setting the bar, bar higher because they know they're going to get that many more customers. No, I think We're if you go to them, to I think take- if you have a good guy like the the guy that I had when I did it originally, like I think that it's it's it is part of the Mm-hmm. you know f- is the test and then the other part of it is asking you like well what do you feel like yeah. like does do you feel like your libido's there do you have the same sex yeah. drive do you have the same motivation to do tasks like you did in the past and i would be interested to see what uh an actual medical intervention would do to raise testosterone like uh hcg i'd be very interested to see what that does to a number because that's well if- I, I tell you what so i have that so i still have i have a a, quite a few kits of HCG because that was some of the protocol that I did before. What I'll do is I want to do the natural route right now because I, I yes, I, I'd love to compare the two. Right, so I'll go the natural route right now, doing the things like the Juvelide and using you know using supplements and things like mm-hmm. that, and then uh, you know uh, meditation. I'm even gonna I'm gonna come off weed before I test. Like I'm gonna do some little things like that to see if all those things can help. And then after that, then I'll do a then I'll do an HCG four week cycle. And then I'll see how much that for sure will raise it. I just want to see if it'll last. <clears throat> yeah, so do I. And I want yeah. to see, and I also want to see how much of a spike will it do. Will it just give me a little bit of one, and like, or will it be a short? I think sometimes it'll push you even off off the charts for some oh, people. Yeah, 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 I've had I've had a few clients, males who had low testosterone, and usually through nutrition intervention, sleep, exercise, proper you know proper mm-hmm. exercise, stress management, usually I can get their testosterone levels to boost considerably. Like I got one guy's. Testosterone levels from 300 to 700. I had another guy raise his another 30. percent But then there was this one dude that it's like we got him up, but it was still really low or in that low range. Well, so he did HCG, and that should put it pushed him out of range. Um, but through a couple cycles of doing that, we eventually got it to normalize, and it actually stayed at a higher. So know, what? What I felt, even though I didn't test, the, I only did the Everly Well test once so far. What I felt was the 
the drop back down. So I felt really good while I was taking it. I felt really good a little bit afterwards. And then you could tell it went down. And then I felt like it came down again. Yeah. Yeah. So. Now you know HCG <clears throat> by itself, if you if abused, can also cause the Leydig cells of the testes, the ones that help make testosterone, to become desensitized and actually start producing less. Right. So you can actually create a negative feedback loop even with uh, HCG. Right. And you can get side effects of like you're taking steroids. Right. With you, HCG. Oh, yeah. No, I've made- I want to say that because I know people listening are like, oh, shit, that's going to solve. No, no, no. You got to be very careful with HCG too because there's so much information out there that gives different recommendations mm-hmm. on the dosage of it. That's really, and like some of these bodybuilder recommendations are extremely high. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I remember the first time that I that I used HCG for a post-cycle uh, therapy, um, I actually felt my uh, uh, gynomastia flare. Oh, gyno. Yeah. yeah. I felt You'll that. You'll get side effects. Yeah, I felt it flare up because it, it actually will, it, would, it, it was too much. You well, know, you know, take- here's, here's a cool thing about HCG. <clears throat> the black market, which is where a lot of people will get this because otherwise you have to get a prescription. The black market for anabolics or hormones is sucks because so often is the shit fake or underdosed or all. So often, actually, probably more often than not. Yeah, watered down. But the cool thing with HCG, well, not cool. There is a way you can test to see if what you have has HCG. It's you can't test how much is in there, but you can actually, uh, in a very inexpensive way, figure out if your kit has HCG in it, and that is through a pregnancy test. Oh, that's right. Yeah, oh. you act, if you squirt it on a pregnancy test because it, pregnancy tests will pick up. Uh, HCG or, or that's what it does to detect pregnancy. It'll call, it'll show up, hmm. and oh, wow. and so you can actually test it that way. Which oh, is kind of wow. cool. Yeah. Did you guys hear about the guy who did the 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 test, the pregnancy test, and showed up positive because he peed on it and thought it would be cute? And what happened? No. <laughs> you didn't hear about this? No. 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 So this dude, this dude, peed on a, a pregnancy test. His wife's, I'm assuming. Yeah, like his girlfriend's, and it said he was pregnant, and he thought it was hilarious. He's like, oh, this is fucking hilarious. It says I'm pregnant. Oh, Obviously, no. I'm not because I'm a guy. Cancer or tumor or something? Yeah, yeah. testicular cancer. Yeah. Because when you have testicular cancer, you'll start yeah. producing this particular hormone. Oh, man. And, and so he posted it on his social media. And I guess one of his friends, or there was a doctor on there, and he's oh, like, yo, man. man, you need to go to the doctor yeah. right away. Wow. And sure enough, he had testicular cancer. Well, it's, I mean, that joke panned off that probably yeah. saved his life right isn't right. that funny yeah wow that's fucked up huh that, that is, is fucked yeah. up yeah. that was yeah. that's something you knew or just something you saw no 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 i read about it a long time ago you're pregnant uh-huh. yeah. Uh, yeah fucking stupid <laughs> test like you got cancer yeah. go to the doctor now <laughs> just imagine his face just i mean like i would if white. you would have never told me that i would have never known that though i would have known yeah. you better you know what i'm saying if someone told me like oh yeah you could totally piss on the pregnancy test and then yeah i would out. immediately think something fucked up with the hormones if you're gonna test positive for pregnancy like come on <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. Not, like come on dude it's like worse than than finding out someone's pregnant you know what i mean yeah, like, yeah. oh shit oh, why does it say pregnant his girlfriend's like well i didn't pee on that he's like thank god <laughs> i just have cancer thank god <laughs> it's actually worse yeah <laughs> you've got cancer anyway i want to ask you guys advice on something kind of personal i'm gonna do it on the podcast this is my therapy oh yes i was wondering what your guys opinion was on uh Talking to therapists. I know you've you you in your childhood, Adam. You I've went been, to therapists. Yeah, I've been in a lot, man. Yeah. I, what is your What is your opinion on something like that? So, <clears> I've tech- never I've never been to one on my own. Mm-hmm. I, I went to one towards the end of my of my marriage. But let me, first, let me I guess let me tell you why I, I, I'm been hmm. kind of throwing this around. You know, I, I got out of a long marriage for 15 years, which I could say probably the last eight to 10 of that year of that marriage and was dysfunctional, was quite dysfunctional, especially the last four years or so was really, really dysfunctional. And I find myself now so apprehensive for certain things because it's almost like it's not post traumatic stress, but it feels like something like that. Like I'm watching a, a, you know, I'm watching the Jersey shore with my girl. Right. And there's all these episodes where uh, Ronnie and his girlfriend getting all these crazy fights and shit and I can feel myself getting like triggered, like like it, I'm getting disgusted by it to the point where I almost don't want to be in a relationship myself because I'm watching something on TV. Oh wow, that's interesting. Mm. Like really bad, you that's know what I mean? Because of all the fighting and dysfunction. Right, right. Yeah. But I've never I've never gone to anybody for anything like that. Hmm. I I think there is uh, an incredible amount of value. I think that I don't think you could go to it and especially someone like you who is has an open mind like leading into it like because a lot of times like when people do therapy 
it's because they got drugged there or because like, you mm. know, their marriage is falling apart. Yeah, I would imagine like, a big part is your willingness. Yeah, exactly. Mm. A big part is just you being open minded and willing to do it. Now, where it may be less valuable for you in comparison to I think to a lot of people is that I think you're a very self aware and intelligent person. Katrina brought up something for me. There was something that I was struggling with, I don't know, that long ago. It might have been this hormone thing where she like I think recommended Yeah, that. she recommended that to me and I kinda like chuckled at her. She goes, Why why you laugh? She goes, you know, it's what I you don't think you can benefit from it? I'm like, no, I'm not saying that. It's just I've been in a lot of therapy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I've been in and out of that stuff and had a lot of people that uh, even even like when I didn't do formal therapy, I, I stayed in contact with uh, a youth pastor of mine and then a, a senior pastor of mine for a long time, and I, I used him kind of like that. And so I, I've had a lot of of you know, and I also train a, a lot of therapists, and so I used a lot of like mm-hmm. training sessions like that. So I think there's incredible value to that. I think where I'm at in my life now that I also have the self-awareness to be okay. Like, okay, let's say there's something I'm, we'll use my struggling with hormones, depression, things like that, that I was going through. Like I'm aware of it. And and then I, I'm also aware enough to like start to do the research and start to like read and dive into things. And I think medita- that's where I'm at right now. Meditate mm-hmm. on yeah. the process of all I that. I think that's where I'm at. I, I have yet to like buy books specifically about, you know, what I'm talking about. And so yeah. I feel like I want to go there first before hiring somebody and sitting down. And I also have you guys. I talk to you guys all the time That's and I appreciate that. And we have the podcast and I'm an open person. You guys know that. I'm not, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, mm-hmm. I'll always talk and, and you know, uh, express how I feel. I'm not embarrassed. I mean, hell, hell, I'm doing it on a public podcast, but it's just, I don't want, the, the problem is I feel like, you know, if I have an argument with my girlfriend, for example, I don't want to be so deep in, in, how my past was that she pays for or that right. I, I, I'm not sure if I can even accurately, if I'm being accurate with, with what I'm saying, because am I saying this because of how I've always felt before, mm-hmm. or am I saying this because of this one situation? And I don't want to be in a position where I question that. Right. Yeah, right. You're trying to be proactive about things you've already recognized. Like, Oh, Oh shit. I built some walls up here, you know, just by seeing this, it, it had me react a mm-hmm. certain way. Like if we do get in a fight, you know, this is going to be something that's like, ah, like it's, it feels like, you know, something that you've already gone through. And it's, it's a lot like hiring a personal trainer. Yeah. I mean, and, and I would think that all three of us would agree. We probably highly recommend to most people that you should hire a trainer at one point in your career if you're not one already. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, it's an outside perspective that gives you great insight. A lot of times you can't right. find that yourself. Right. And uh, if you can find that yourself, like you're saying self-awareness wise, like I think that's, it's valuable then to dive into it and do research. And that's and just really, it. You have yeah. to ask yourself if you're the person that will, will do that. Now I know you. And I know, I know the type of people we are and the, where I'm at in my life and where I think you're at in your life that you will read something and start to dive in and learn. And I think you'll get as much value, if not more value, than even sitting down and having someone tell mm-hmm. you, right? So, Yeah, I think, that's, you're, I think that's kind of where I'm at. I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with something like that because, you know, it's like this. It's like, you know, if the, and I, by the way, you know, I have a tough time saying this sometimes, not because I have a tough time saying it, but because I don't want people to have a negative view of my ex-wife. Because believe me, there's two people in that relationship. There's definitely two sides to it, and we both contributed. Mm-hmm. And we're, Which is and we're, also what makes you, the, why I said what I just said, is that because you have that ability to see that, it's like when I talked about, uh, I've talked about being cheated on by my ex, and that was the first time that ever happened to me, and, it, and it, so many people are like, oh my God, fuck her. And I'm like, no, not fuck her. Like, you know, you recognize what, your side. Of yeah. It. What mm-hmm. did I do? Like, th- this is definitely a growth opportunity for me. There's mm-hmm. something in this relationship, like the fact that she felt the need to go outside of our relationship for some sort of attention mm-hmm. or love or whatever it may have been. There's something to be, there's something that I can't control her. Mm-hmm. I can't do anything. You can't do anything about your ex wife. But what you can do is dive deeper into what role of that did you play yeah. in that? Oh, yeah, no. I, and that, you're the type of person who I think... Oh, I've dug very deep into that. I've admitted a lot of things that I've done wrong, and I, I, I understand that. But the last, especially the last four years or so, was just this constant dysfunction, constant fighting, constant... It's just a terrible environment overall. And so what, what I don't want is for... Because then, you know, I got divorced, and I was done. Trust me, I was done years before I actually left. I think both of us were, which is why we both transitioned and, and were able to be amicable at the end because we both agreed this is what we need to do. But it's like, if I get in an argument now, I don't want it to feel like it's an... It's like a... It's almost like you, you have a limit, right? You have this limit of, that you, of, of drama that you can handle, 
And it's like, it's not fair to the person I'm with now that my limit is so fucking right. high. You ramp way up. Well, I know this. Like, yeah. I know when somebody's mood changes in a way that feels irrational to me. First off, irrational to me is probably, I'm probably extra sensitive to it because of how things were before, right? Mm -hmm. And number two, like, there's not that much leeway. If I, if somebody, if there's a, any kind of a raising of a voice, voice or any kind of an emotion shift, I'm like run i don't want to like i don't want to deal with this at all because i dealt with it for so long mm -hmm. beforehand so anyway i think that's where i'm at i think i'm gonna buy some some books and just start doing my own research and reading about it yeah um, i just want to say to the that the audience is listening i think that um I, I am a big fan of it and i do uh, think that a majority i think everybody can benefit from it so yeah. i think it's i think overall it's a really good thing it's like everybody could benefit from a personal yeah. trainer even if you are a personal trainer could yeah. you not benefit from going in and sure. being trained by someone sure. who's even more educated in that mm -hmm. field mm -hmm. absolutely mm -hmm. yeah. Do I think it's necessary? No, I don't think it's necessary. And I think there are people out there that, just like with personal training, I think there's people that can never... I mean, I've never hired a personal trainer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everything, I've always... You know, I've figured it out sure. myself. So if you're if you're passionate about growth, you're passionate about learning about yourself, yep. which I feel you are, yep. I think you can accomplish a lot of that stuff on your own. Could it fast track you there by hiring a trainer and spending the money there? Or, I mean, hi hiring a therapist? Yeah, and there's also, too, like, just with your partner. I mean, I know you guys probably, like, it's really easy to discuss things because it's, like, you know, something that you guys have established in a relationship. And for me, like, with my wife, you know, we did go through a little bit of counseling, which is, you know, not therapy, but it's definitely having mm -hmm. somebody else in the room to sure identify things and, and present things and um, contemplate, you know, what, what problems may arise based off of our value system. And, you know, so w we went through that whole process and it was very, very helpful. Mm -hmm. So I, I definitely, I think, you know, relationship wise too, to, cause I mean, you can get so far as to like explain things with your partner one-to-one, yeah. -one, but having somebody else, it, it, they just, they, they frame it in a different light to where a lot of times my wife could be like, oh, okay. And then she gets like yeah. what I'm trying to say. Yeah. I mean, I've been before, like I said, towards the end of my marriage and it was definitely helpful. It helped us, you know, make that decision to, to, you know, end everything or whatever. But I, I want to feel like totally ready. Like, okay, that's what I want right now. And I haven't, I don't feel like I've done the other stuff yet first, which is like read some books on it and well, dive into it. What so. they're, what they're really good at doing is like, asking you like a question like you know hey when you watch jersey shore sal like you know what do you feel they ask you that first and then sure. you explain you so then and then they say well why do you feel that way yeah, yeah, yeah. and then you explain why that and then they and then what they do really good is like you may start to take off on them like well you know where i used to this and then my wife and then you start going they go, whoa, whoa stop right there you know you just said something right now yeah. you know yeah. so like i could do this with you all day and they just get you to start to Think about what you're saying, which I think like, I think you do a really good job yeah. of. I think I have a good partner too because she she right, allows yeah, us to, to you know to, we can talk we can talk a lot, but you know yeah. I I don't want her to 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 have to you know bear the brunt of you know whatever else comes out of it. So sure we'll see we'll see what happens. I'll tell you what though, it's been I, I've definitely changed and grown a lot since that period of time, and I, I am a growth minded person. I just want it to happen faster. So we'll see we'll see what happens. Yeah. If you're a listener of both Mind Pump and RX Radio, you guys will have to tag Jordan Shallow and talk shit to him because I'm I'm gonna punk him right now. What would he do? Uh -oh. <laughs> No, he, I'm not. I'm not letting him on the show anymore. That's what I'm gonna tell him. No, so, what do you do? Yeah, no, no, no. I would. I would totally let him on. I'm just gonna. Of course, tease him. we love him. But I, my, my inbox is just. And I, and I apologize if you're somebody who's still there. Um, I saw that I still had people from six days ago. I don't ever let the thing get that crazy, but it's just been overwhelming this last this last like week, especially since Jordan Shallow's episode because I must have had fifty DMs on people asking me to interpret half the shit that the motherfucker said <laughs> on the podcast. You know what's funny? And so you know, he, we bring him on the show, yeah. and he just added work to me, dude. I was like, the whole point oh, of wow. having you on here is to take some of the load off for Bro, us. Bro, nobody, nobody DM'd me about that. Nobody did? No, but I think it's because they feel like I'll explain it. The same this is way. Complicated. Yeah, you will. Yeah. They know I'll dumb it way yeah. down. <laughs> like, yeah. ask Adam. He'll say it in way yeah. simpler yeah, that's terms. Hilarious. What was he saying? Yeah. Bend your elbow when you do that lift. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this quaz brought to you by Organify. 
For those days you fall short on getting your organic veggies or whole food nutrition, Organifi fills the gap with laboratory tested certified organic superfoods to help give your health and performance the added edge. Try Organifi totally risk free for 60 days by going to Organifi.com. That's O R G A N I F I.com. And use the coupon code MINDPUMP for 20% off at checkout. First question is from Robert M75. Is there any reason to attempt a one rep max? If so, is there a way you suggest going about doing it? I have two thought or two thoughts on this. Yes and no. Yeah, you can make an <laughs> argument for both. I do. Yes you and no. You have to take a position out of it. I'll make the argument for, but you go ahead. Well, okay, so if you're going to make the argument for, let me make the argument for not at first. Yeah. Um what I what I see and what I've experienced myself when 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 chasing the one rep, you can build an incredible physique and be extremely healthy and never test your one rep max your entire life. Yeah, for sure. Totally. Agree. For sure, you can never ever max out on a lift. And I would argue that that may be a good strategy for a majority of people because there is risk that comes with lifting that heavy weight and you need to be pretty damn experienced on how to bail on a squat or a deadlift or a bench press the right way if you're going to be max lifting and then on top on top of that the other knock i have on it and this is to knock crossfit a little bit is we got into this this pr culture like pr mm -hmm. didn't even exist when i started as a trainer no i didn't even know what pr was until like I, like after like yeah. year a couple of years of hearing people like oh my pr i'm like what the fuck is pr like I never heard that term when I first started as a trainer, but it's become so popular that everybody is chasing their one rep, rep, one rep max. And I would argue that it's contributing to a lot of the injuries that you see in things like CrossFit. Mm -hmm. So that's my no, even though I have, I could say yes. Well, to I, I'm going to agree with you and I'm going to add more to that and say that if you just, if you want to be fit, strong, healthy, whatever, there's no reason. Yeah. I, I don't see what the reason is. As long as you understand how to judge your perceived effort and train relatively intensely. I don't know why I don't know why that would be important. The only way the only thing I can think of why it's important to test out how much you can lift for one rep for a max. And by the way, we're not talking about training with with low reps like doing sets of one. We're talking about maxing out for a for a rep. That's a big difference because I can I can I've trained many many clients with reps as low as one, but when you're doing that, you're not maxing out. You're doing something like 80% of their max or whatever. It's heavy, but it's something that they can do and they can duplicate for sets. A max is literally the most you can lift for a single rep. And I guess the only benefit I could see to that is if you're trying to figure out your percentages of your max or you're trying to figure out if you're, you know, you're getting motivated by the fact that your max went up. Mm -hmm. But here's the deal. You, you don't need to max out to see if you're stronger. If, if Let's say you're working out with me. Let's say you're my client and we're doing... We did six reps on the squat, six heavy reps on the squat, and your perceived effort was pretty hard. Like You're like, oh, that was pretty intense. I feel like I maybe would have been able to squeeze out one or two more reps, but we did six. The next time I train you and you do the same weight for six reps, you'll know if you're stronger because you're like, oh, wow, this is easier. I can actually do seven reps with the same perceived uh, intensity or the same perceived effort. Yeah. And so you, that's why it's hard for me to even justify. I don't think I've ever right. had any client – Except for maybe Doug and a couple others who I are very think, competitive and, and with good instruction. Sure, I agree with you guys. But at the same time, being an athlete and having gratifying moments that I can think of in my weight training career, in my athletic career, um, a lot of them were when I pressed my body to the limits. And this is one of those things. If you feel like you've been doing the work and this has been um, you know, a few years even in the making, like mm -hmm. I'm not talking about doing this like every year even, or, or like every couple months, like I'm trying, like I'm talking about like, this is something that I've been working my ass up towards. Mm -hmm. And if I want to, I want to see tangible evidence of strength that I can summon. Um, there's nothing better than a one rep max. So I, I do, I do see that the argument that like it's is it unnecessary? Yes, it's unnecessary because I could still just do multiple reps and and get gratification from that and uh, still be able to. Well, it's I, not going to hammer my body to where. Well, I'm, you'll, you'll still see you're stronger. I can I can get on board with the the athlete thing, and the reason why I can get on board with the athlete thing because 
if you play sports competitively, you there will be times when you're playing where you're going to stretch your limits or you'll be challenged mm-hmm. with that of mm-hmm. wanting to fold, wanting to break, wanting to give up because your body is wanting to shut down. Yeah. And there's something about the the uh, what the, what it's the, a mental the it's CNS the positive things you're going to get too. for your CNS, the positive things you're going to get for the psychological piece. There are some there are some really good benefits to pushing to that limit. Now the greater the benefits with things like that, the greater the risk. Yep. And so, who I'm talking to would would totally change this. Would change my advice, right? So, if it's somebody who's extremely advanced, you're an athlete. You're, I get it. Or, or you're, or you're, or you're competing in in powerlifting. Like that makes sense well, for sure. That makes sense. right. That makes sense. But if you're yeah. just, if you're a mind pump listener and you're a, you love to lift weights, you want to be healthy, you want to be strong, you want to look good, mm-hmm. and those are pretty much your main goals of why you work out. It doesn't really serve that big of a purpose mm-hmm. in your routine. The risk is too high. Look, here's what happens when you go when you go to failure on any set of resistance. As you go to failure, your form starts to break down. And so now you're <coughs> supporting a weight or holding a weight or lifting a weight with suboptimal form, which increases the risk of injury. Now with a one rep max, it's even worse because you're lifting the heaviest weight you could possibly lift for one rep. And so if your form is off a little bit, like, look, if I'm doing a set of 20 with a squat and my form is off, I may be doing that with, you know, 275 pounds, right? If I do a one rep max and my form is off a little bit, I'm going to have, I might have up to 400 pounds on my back. The risk of injury is quite high. Now, that being said, I test my rep, one rep max all the time. Why? Because I've, I'm experienced and I enjoy the challenge of it and I enjoy seeing the progress. And so from that standpoint – then I can see the benefit. But I don't see that happening with a lot of people. I think I see that happening with a small percentage of people or at least a small percentage of people that I think should be attempting one rep maxes. That being said, if you are going to test your one rep max, there is some advice I have for you. Don't guess what your one rep max is by throwing a bunch of weight on the bar. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're laughing, but that's no, that's what people do. No, no, They'll be like, that. oh, well, I they lift. just feel it. Yeah, normally I lift 135. So yeah, let's try 225 and see if that's my max. No, 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 no. no. Bad strategy. Give yourself a lot of time to slowly inch your way up to your one rep max. So I'll give you an example. Let's say I can do 315. Uh, I can squat 315 pounds, let's say 10, pound, uh, 10 times. Let's say that's my... My, I know I can muster out at least 10 repetitions. I'm going to go up. I might start off going up 15 or 20 pounds. And then as I get closer to the weight where I start to feel it starts to really get heavy, I'm only going up by two to five pounds. And that's it. I'm doing one rep each time to not fatigue myself. But the, the last thing you want to do is overshoot what you think your max is, fail. That's, and, good. that's good advice. Yeah. You don't, I mean. don't want to fail because now you've failed, which is tough. Let me tell you. Failing on some lifts like a bench press or an overhead press or a squat, you need to have a technique on how to fail, by the way. There's a technique uh, yeah. to lifting it and there's a technique to failing because you could have a great squat and not know how to dump the bar or not how to sure. not know how to drop it on on safeties. Yeah. And that's what people tend to hurt themselves. So you gotta have that technique. Um, and also when you fail at a one rep max attempt, you're fried. So now mm-hmm. your one rep max is lower. So now you try to back off on the weight and you're really not you don't know what your one rep max could have been because you've literally just done a force negative with the with, so, with heavy weight which fucks you fries I've, you. I've never been somebody mm-hmm. to really calculate the percentages out for something like this because I've never been into powerlifting com- competing but I have checked I have checked my one rep max and I was kind of thinking like how do I get to that number? How do I figure that out? And listening to you talk I'm like you know what there, there is like a formula or a a pattern that I have when I'm trying to test this, right? And if I if it's if it's upper body, like bench press, overhead press, I'm I'm ch- I'm chain I'm uh, testing a max there. I'm gonna keep going. I'm gonna keep going up and wait until I find a weight that I can only get about five reps. Once I get to a weight where I can get only about five reps, then what I do is I incrementally go up five to ten pounds. Slow, it's small because, because it's upper body, mm-hmm. right? And then I, I just keep going up each each, and I give myself long rest periods in between. Then I add five to ten pounds, mm-hmm. go long rest period five to ten pounds. I keep going until I can only squeeze out one or two reps, and then I've, I've got an idea of where my one rep max is going to be at. Right? If it's legs, I can go a little bit. I can go a little bit faster than five or 10 pounds. I can go like 15 to 20 pounds mm-hmm. uh, every single time. So I'll go all the way, I'll squat or deadlift until I can only get five reps with that weight. Mm-hmm. And then from there, I'm inching up 
20 pounds at a time, so 10 pounds on sure. each side until I can kind of get to the point where I can find what my singles or doubles would be at. Yeah, yeah, same thing. And, mm-hmm. and as far as how often you should test your one rep max, if you, if this is if you're that person who's experienced, has good control, knows how to dump a weight or knows how to fail, I would say it's probably safe safe to to max out once every other month. It's probably a good idea. Once a month you might be able to get away with two, but that's probably pushing it. I would say probably once every two months because you got to give yourself some time to build your strength up or do some back off well, you know, sets. Well, a perfect world if you're following maps, like if, if you were to incorporate this with maps programming or how I would do yeah, it be is the end of your programming. The, well, I would do the end of every strength phase. Yeah. So like which is usually three to five weeks, right? So yeah. at, it's, and then as you cycle back through, I would do it again at the end of the strength mm-hmm. phase. So yeah. r- run the, the, any of the maps programs. And when you get to the end of the strength phase, you know, that would be you when you test it, yep. then you would go and transition to the next phase. When you come back around through a, that MAPS program or another MAPS program, you could test it yep, again. Yep. I mean, you know, that, that being said, you know, training at that limit or that type of, you know, max capacity for a rep, there's definitely a skill that's involved that's unique to it. So what I mean by that is for those of you who are competitors or who do find lots of value in this, who also, again, are experienced and know what they're doing – the more you practice one rep maxing, the better you get at it because there is a skill involved. Yeah. The weight moves different. It takes a different type of intensity uh, and drive and focus. And finding um, that right amount to ramp up to yep. you know, the ultimate output is definitely part of the process. The skill you need to learn, like, you know, it, did I do too much? Like, is that going to take away from my one rep max? Do I, did I not do enough? So I, I primed my body properly for this. So this is all things that you have to literally practice in, in to, to build up to that experience where now uh, this is something that you, you start to get yeah. good at. Are there any lifts that you guys will test more often than others or lifts that you don't like to test out with one rep max? I, I test the I most test with my squ- squat. squat. Oh, you do? Yep. Uh, test I test my squat and, and I used to test my, test my bench a lot. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah. That, I, I, I got a lot of pride in that for a while and then I haven't in years. So it's been a skill I've lost, you know. Yeah, but, squat and deadlift. See, I oh, never... Overhead press. See, I, I, test I never test press. my bench because uh, my, my shoulders are okay if I don't push it too hard. But if I max out, my form always goes off a little bit and I end up feeling it my AC joint on yeah. my right shoulder. Yeah. Yeah. I don't I, I rarely ever max out in squats because I hate failing on a squat. That is a terrifying feeling. Yeah. And dumping a bar is a very loud uh, occurrence. I've gotten really good at it. I bail I bail on yeah, I bail on yeah. squats pretty good. Like that's so squat getting out that's of That's what I'm a, saying. It's a skill. I scare people around me. So I, I can dump it behind me. That's no why problem. I yeah, I, I feel okay. I feel the best about pushing my limits on the squat because I feel the most comfortable with actually getting out of it. There you go. Chest and over overhead press, I don't. Yeah. Those like if I'm pushing an overhead press, like if I'm going to compensate anywhere, it's going to be my low back arching, and I'm I'm afraid of stuff like that. Exactly. Yeah. So you got to know this. See, right. And deadlift for me, I'm a little weary because of an injury I got mm. while doing it. You know, the other time when I hurt my I'm a QL a bit, but yeah, it's like. That that's that's one of those things that just sticks in your head. So now you have to overcome these barriers yeah. that you've placed. Oh no, deadlifts psychologically. For me, deadlifts for me, that's the one that I'll test because I just feel yeah. most comfortable. You could drop the bar; it's right down in front oh, of you. Yeah. And I've been through some grinders. Let me tell you, I've been through some deadlifts that were they felt like it took me five minutes to get the bar yeah. up into position. Those can be pretty nasty. <laughs> those can yeah. be very very nasty. Yeah. Next question is from Cell Carp. What are your thoughts on why childhood obesity continues to grow? Your opinions on how it got so bad and how we should fix it. This is a this is a scary problem. It, mm. You know, childhood obesity is it's scary because it wasn't that long ago that childhood obesity almost didn't even exist. Yep. No joke. Like it almost didn't even exist. When I first got my fir- when I got my first personal training certification back in 1997, they called uh, type 2 diabetes, in my book, in the actual certification, it was called adult onset uh, diabetes. It wasn't called type 2 diabetes. There was type 1 diabetes where you're not making insulin and you need insulin. And then there was adult onset diabetes because this was the type of diabetes that you developed as an adult through you know poor diet, uh, you yeah, know, we believe, bad lifestyle. We believed you could only get it as an adult. That's because yeah. that's all that ever ha- ever had. It never happened that way. It never happened where a kid wasn't born with diabetes Which, and me, then got it. it until- I don't. I don't understand how that's not so fucking scary as a parent to see what has happened just in the last 30, 40 years 
with childhood with 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 obesity and diabetes in children like that's crazy to think it's, that it didn't exist mm. 50 years ago and now it's something that is it, it been on the rise and there has to be like an epigenetic component where like I don't lot, think so you, I, I think I think it's less I think it's less of that and more of what we see more of this sitting in front of video games and computers and phones and then eating fire Cheetos and, well, except and drinking for, except sodas except for how you're setting them up like from from the womb like, mm. Well, yeah, I'm not disagreeing with you that yeah. that that may not be a, a role being played, but I think it's it's less of that and it's more of our society right now. Wow, I, I don't think that I, we've never been here before. Where a kid, I mean, when you were a kid, we remember it wasn't that long ago. Yeah. You know, what I'm saying when you were a kid, you died. It's one well, generation. There was, there yeah, was literally exactly. like one kid at school. You knew it was like the fat kid, right? Like, and now it's it, it literally it makes up almost I mean it's not the majority but it's it's a very high percentage that uh, yeah it's it's totally a brand new thing that like now we're like oh well this is like the new normal here's what here's what here check this out so I just looked up the statistics this is from the CDC and it shows that childhood obesity has tripled has more than tripled since ni- the 1970s. This wasn't that long ago at all. It wasn't that long ago at all since the 1970s. Today, or data that we have from 2015 to 2016, shows that one in five school-aged children has obesity. One out of every five. So that's tripled that's from insane. 1970. Here's the part that really bothers me. is that As I'm going down and scrolling down the CDC website, they say many factors contribute to childhood obesity, mm-hmm. including, ready for this? Here's the top two. Genetics. Metabolism, which is okay. What do you mean metabolism? What the fuck does that mean? That right. could be changed, whatever. Genetics, uh, wrong. Right. Sorry, uh, we did not evolve. We didn't evolve rapidly since you know for the last forty years, where all of a sudden what we went from you know one out of every fifteen kids or something like that to now one out of every five has obesity. That doesn't work. Then number Both three, of is, those are cop outs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then number three is community and neighborhood design and safety. What? Short sleep duration, maybe. And then finally, the last one they put is eating and physical activity behavior. Oh, you think. <laughs> the last part, yeah. Oh, you really think. Right. This is, here's what's scary about this. Besides the fact that these are children, and you know that's terrible because in many cases, these children are not at fault for their poor health because you know kids don't typically go grocery shopping. They don't typically buy the food. They don't... They don't they, 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 how you eat and your eating behaviors and patterns, there's a large part of it that is learned through your environment. Well, it's a direct reflection of, of the environment that, you know, the parents have provided. And, you know, however you want to spin it, uh, they're dependent on, you know, this food coming from, you know, the source where it's coming from. And that's from the parents. That's so. right. But what the scary thing for me is is less about the kids being obese and the fact that a child that's obese has a very, very high likelihood of growing up to be an unhealthy adult. And what we know about health is this, is that the longer you're unhealthy, the worse that unhealthy becomes. I wonder what the, if you are, and here's another thing too, some parents, like, and I see this a lot. I remember having this conversation with uh, Katrina years back, and we were talking about, you know, kids and overweight, and I was pointing out a kid that was overweight. And, oh, that's, you know, because he's really young, he's, that's his baby fat or whatever like that. I'm like, no. You know, he's carrying like 20 pounds yeah, for that. of excess weight as a child. Like, that is not baby fat. That's not like he's not going to grow out not of like it. transitional yeah. fat. Like no, there's a lot, a lot of parents, they just think they're going through a phase and that they'll grow out of it or grow into their body. And it's like, no, they have a belly that is hanging over their, their shorts and they're 10 years old. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. that... They're they're being fed and they're not moving enough. Well, and the, yeah, and the play is different now. Like you know, just the different. focus with all their friends is different. Like what they do now is different. There's so many different contributing patterns to this that like all these variables now. Like it's it's so much set up for obesity to occur. It's just, I, ha- I have a very very strong opinion on this. This this is just a subject that's been it was been a passion of mine for a very very long time about what I think is is the cause for. It. But before I go in that, check out this statistic. If you have an obese two-year-old, two, okay? So this is somebody who was born two years ago, right? An obese two-year-old has a 75% chance of being obese at 35. Now, a normal two-year-old today has a 57% chance 
of being obese just because that's our obesity rate among adults. So that's a big difference. That's a difference of about 20% increase in risk. A 19-year-old that's obese has an 88% risk of being obese. A 19-year-old who's not obese only has a 44% risk. So what this tells us is the longer you're not obese, the lower your likelihood of being an obese adult. Mm. If you're obese as in, as, uh, when you're young, the likelihood that you'll be obese increases. And the longer you stay obese, like if you're a teenager that's obese, the odds that you're going to be an obese adult is almost 100%. It's close to 90%. I used to tell my, my female clients that I get that were in their 20s, this and it's this is totally my experience. I have no studies or anything to prove this, but in my experience, if I had met somebody who had not figured out uh, a healthy eating eating habits and an exercise routine by about twenty five or twenty six, that the likelihood of her being you know overweight or obese in the future is really, really high and the likelihood of them ever getting in really good shape is really, really low mm-hmm. because they haven't installed those behaviors and habits by the time they're in their mid twenties. They're so ingrained. It's so rare. And and I do have examples. I mean I've trained thousands of people, so of course I've got mm-hmm. handfuls of forty year old clients that came to me that were obese and I changed their lives and what with that. But they're so small. It's so so small and it's far a between. very hard thing to change. Here's here's what I think. Look, I think the the lack of physical activity is not the main culprit yeah. when it comes to obesity. I think the lack of physical activity is the main culprit for the physical dysfunction that we see in kids, like forward shoulder, uh, forward head, the fact that kids now have, you know, you see a lot of uh, pronating feet and, you know, issues with well, knees which and back. It contributes and, to yeah. even less movement. Actually. Yeah, I, that's, what, that's what I blame on that. But as far as obesity is concerned, you could place that squarely at the feet of how we feed our kids, 100%. Yeah. Look at do this for me. Go to a grocery store and go to the kids' food section and try and find foods that are not totally bad for you. Yeah. Like, good luck. Yeah, good the, luck. The vast majority of the foods that are dedicated to kids is fast. It's it's heavily processed, high long shelf life, heavily uh, easy to access, well, even before highly that, palatable. It's, it's tons formula. of sugar. Highly, pa- highly palatable food. Now, why is that? Is it because we have an evil food industry? No, I think the food industry is smart. I think there's definitely some evil people in the food industry. <laughs> they're just smart. They're trying to. Their job. Their job is to sell. And, they're, and not they don't only, give a fuck who eats it, what happens at, right. if you eat too much. They of it. give you what you want. Right. That's what selling is. Right, you give right. someone what they want. Now, what do parents want? Well, they want. Fast, easy, Ease of access. and they want highly palatable for their kids yes, because sir. I'm a parent of two children. You know, Justin can probably echo this. One of the most stressful things or times of the day with kids is feeding time. Feeding Always, mm-hmm. ever ever since they, you know, they're, they're in a high chair. And you're feeding them yourselves. It's, it's like a battlegrounds. Always. It's all, I mean, it's, yeah. it's not always, but it's common. It's a common battleground. And so if you can create a child's food that the kid will just love to eat, I mean, parents are just like, oh, thank uh, yeah. God. They feel like, oh, oh. yes. Oh, yeah. look, goldfish. Look at look at goldfish. Why do you think goldfish is so popular? Because yeah. kids love eating them. And so parents are like, oh, easy so snack. eating something. Yeah, eat some goldfish. This is so easy for you. Yeah. So that's the big problem. The big problem is, is the food and the, and the big blame goes on the parents. Well, period. I mean, it's uncomfortable, but it starts early, man, with the, your decision-making process. Like, mm-hmm. you know, like as... Like I'm sorry, but breastfeeding's fucking hard. It's one of the hardest things like women can do, you know. And I know my wife going through that was like expressing that to me. Like this is so difficult, and all it's very tempting to stop, and it's so much easier to do formula. Right. It's very easy to do. Formula. They have connected formula to higher rates of obesity and and, health, and you know nobody wants to talk about like that, that. You right. know, it's, sorry. It's it's, oh, it's a very sensitive topic right now sensitive. for my. I have my two best friends who are having kids right now, and like. You know, it was they they have a newborn right now and I'm yeah. already feeding her um but you can him, you can pump. Him, uh yeah, there's yeah. there's options, there's things you can do, and there's also like uh was it wet banks or whatever mm-hmm. or it too. So anyways, I mean I obviously that that's like third That's one third, factor, by the way. Yeah, that's that's just one thing. I'm just saying like like thinking in terms of like setting up mm-hmm. you know, your your child's like health in the future. It's, it's like you know, it starts like right away. It does have a lower risk of obesity, that's a fact when they breastfeed. Part of it is the is could be the health uh, aspects of it. And the other part of it could be because I don't want to throw this out either. And I'm not saying breast milk isn't the most healthy thing you can give your child. I believe it is, just as we evolved to have it. So I don't think scientists have created anything that can that can 
mimic nature perfectly yet. I think we will in the future, but I don't think we have yet. But I think the other part of it is this, the kind of parents that tend to not breastfeed and want to give their kids formula probably are also the kind of parents that are very busy right. and that don't have the, the time. They also to throw the goldfish. Of access. Right. And the, so it's, there's, you know, expediency becomes, you right. know, quite, and look, modern life is very difficult. Yep. Modern life, to, you know, there's a lot of shit going on. And so, I mean, look, parents used to spend time on making food and making meals and taking the time to feed them and all that stuff. And it's not like that anymore. And here's the other thing too. Likely, it's highly likely if you see an obese kid, you have they have obese parents. Mm-hmm. It's highly likely. It's actually I can probably bet you nine out of ten times. Well, that's the real that's the, case. The, the real challenge is that it does start with the parents. And I know it sounds like we're over here. Yeah, because you can't just change your kids' eating. Yeah, you got to change your own. Right. You know what I mean? And it's, that's where the the real challenge comes in. Let's be honest. It's like, you know, the, the parents are are struggling with the kids, the habits, but. I mean, if you're a parent that didn't have any of that stuff in your cupboard on the weekends, you guys did things like hikes and played sports outside and you did physical things like, well, I I doubt you would be struggling with this Mm -hmm. very much. But if you have a kid that is, you know, obese or really overweight and they play video games, they eat fire Cheetos all the time. And on the weekends, they muck out on video games while you do other things like yeah, fuck. It's gonna be really, really tough to manage this. It's. And- a, it, I, I can. I feel for parents in situations like this because let's say you're a parent and you've got you know two kids or three kids, and let's say your youngest is four and your oldest is I don't know you know twelve or something like that, eleven, and you're like, okay, everybody, everybody's obese. I'm obese. My kids are all obese. I need to change everybody's eating habits because it's just not healthy. And I know that I'm also somebody that needs to change my eating habits. Let's say you're a really self-aware parent and that's your position. Well, now you have to be willing to go through roughly two or three months of shit. That's at least it's going to take that long because kids may not be on board and the kids eat what you buy. And so they're going to protest. They're going to fight. They may not eat. You may have your kids say, fine i'm not having dinner at all and now you got to play that game where you wait it out until your kid is starving and and, and decides to finally eat so you have to commit to a shitty house life for a few months you have to go through a little bit of hell it's going to be that way but what is the benefit well i can i don't i I can tell you 100 percent what the negative will be if you don't do that here's what's guaranteed you're guaranteed to have children who are going to if they're obese and unhealthy less mobility they're going to find less pleasure in physical activities of course risk their uh, raises the risk of things like ostr- being ostracized with other kids bullying all that stuff and then health problems the health problems that you're setting your child up for when they're older is 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 very very high and i don't i don't buy the whole but they don't do what i say bullshit that's bullshit sure if you have a teenager that's got a car at that point very very difficult but if it's your house, you buy the groceries, you're the one that's in charge. So when they go to the cupboard to open it up to find a snack and all they see is nothing and maybe there's, you know, cheese, you know, wheels and carrot sticks and apples and you're like, "Well, that's what we got." So if you want a snack, you can eat that. If you don't, then there's nothing else. All right. You know, then 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 watch what happens. But it's going to start with the it's, parents. I've never yeah. seen a parent. It's funny that the, where, where where we're at right now in our lives that that seems like punishment or so evil to do that. Just a few hundred years ago, you know, what I'm saying like yeah. if you had food, if your child was hungry, oh my God, so we have it's a the carrot. opposite. Yeah, you were like dying to get them food, right. you know, and like that was like the priority was just to be able to get them food and nourished. And now it's completely the opposite problem. Which yeah. is, I think, also part of the problem is that we're oversaturating our children with stuff like that, and they, they're, we're already training them to these meal times and thinking that they have to eat every single two to three hours or three or four times a day. When in reality, they probably, especially if their activity is low, they probably don't. Yeah. And I hate to draw the same, uh, the, draw a parallel to my dogs because humans and dogs are different in a lot of ways. But I mean, it's the same way. Like I feed the boys. It's like if I didn't get if I didn't get off my ass as an owner. Because this is true. I'm I'm a, I'm not a perfect dog owner all the time where I walk my dogs and exercise them like I should. I feed them differently. Yeah. They don't get fucking four cups of food every day mm-hmm. if I don't go out and exercise them. Otherwise, they put on the weight really fast. And yeah. so 
Why would we treat the kids any different than that? Why would you? Yeah, and when they eat the snacks that are like crackers and you know sugar stuff, like that makes them more hungry. Well, and, and, and <laughs> yep, and, and, and it's just like the, and now you're just overwhelming them with even more calories. And no, typically it's true. when we let them do it is at the worst times when they're sitting down watching TV for two, three hours straight, or playing video games for four or five hours, and I mean they're and they're drinking soda and shoveling the food. It's like, man, it's. I'm not trying to demonize certain foods or say your kid should never be allowed to ever have a fire cheater like that. I'm not trying to say that at all, but it's like where it's compounding because of all these other things, because they're not yeah. moving, because they're sitting still. And on top of that, you're feeding them these types of food or allowing them to eat oh, yeah. these types of it's, foods while they're, they're doing they, that. Yeah, they still have the flexibility and it still makes its way in. But I just recognize the battle of it, mm -hmm. and like that it's always there. And then I'm willing to, you know, at least recognize you know like okay i need to i need to like handle this and make sure that i'm on top of this and by the way like you know we always recommend when people change their own eating habits that they do it slowly yeah one step at a time totally if you're a, if it you has to stick if you're the head of household or whatever your mom or dad and you have kids and you're like okay we need to change our eating habits and you've identified that you need to change your own because nine out of ten times it's everybody's eating shitty not just the kids it's everybody right start slow Start real slow. Yeah. Maybe you do it so slow the kids don't even notice. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Maybe mm -hmm. it's just like, hey, mom, why are the snacks uh, this way th this time? Or wait, we're, how come we're not having you know bread with with our dinner tonight? Or right. well, you know, what's, why aren't we drinking soda? Or why did you change the juice from you know this brand to this brand? Because you can slowly start implementing these things for yourself and for the family. And make it, uh, you know, right. a little bit. And then their palate will change, and yeah. you know, and then you can introduce more healthy stuff. Yeah, That's right. it, it totally is. Like it, you, you have to do it at the speed of what uh, they're going to accept. But I'm telling you right now, if this doesn't change, if this doesn't become something that p parents start to do now, we are going to be footing the bill for this younger generation when they become adults. Uh, it uh, it could screw us up pretty bad. Next up is mind to muscle. Do you have any regrets? You know, it's crazy that we went this way because I wanted to ask you and Justin, because I think this is a great segue into this and gives an opportunity for you guys to kind of talk about, I know you probably th are thinking of regrets personally, but be interesting to hear you guys talk about like, you know, as we just sit here and talk about childhood obesity and the challenges that you guys both probably deal with, with the dinner table and these things like that, you know, is there a little bit of ownership on your part where you go like, you know, fuck, I did allow the kids to do certain things five years ago or six years ago that I wish I would have done differently now. Can you think of things all like the that? time? Yeah. I can, I can think of this all the time. You know, for me personally, the part of this issue when it comes to feeding and eating, especially with my kids, you know, in my culture or at least in the culture of my parents, right? The one that I was raised in food, you feed the hell out of your kids and that's how you show them that you love them. And if they don't eat, you know, it's a uh, it's a big problem. And so you're constantly force feeding kids. And when I was young, I remember, I mean, my grandma would say things like to, to me and my cousins, like, let's see who can finish first. Whoever finishes first gets $5. Oh my God. You know? <laughs> you guys really did shit like that? Yeah, they would actually make us compete. <laughs> straight, over... straight bribing you to eat more food. <laughs> yes. Um, if we didn't eat, we would get in trouble. Um, meals always started with starches. So... You know, you, you would start every meal with pasta and bread, um, and then you'd end up finishing with the, you know, the protein and, and the fat or whatever, and the vegetables. That would be kind of at the end. So it's kind of like this backwards order, uh, uh, you know, of how you eat. So it's, um, those are things that I've done, that I did with my kids. Like my, we would have meals and they would start off with pasta and bread, and then we would move towards the, mm. the, the, the healthier thing. So that I regret, you know, doing. I don't do it anymore, and that's the, actually thanks to Jessica. She came up with this. She, it's brilliant. It really is very simple, but it's quite brilliant. And where we serve in reverse, man, we serve in reverse of what everybody else does. Isn't that crazy to yeah. think that? Like that, that oh, oh, just a great healthy strategy right out the gate is think about how every restaurant serves you food, yeah. and serve it the opposite. Well, I guess dessert sometimes is served last, yeah. so that except for that. Well, right? they'll serve you bread first because it t tends to make you hungry. But right. so what I do, what we do now with the kids is we start with vegetables. Then we move to the to the meat, the protein, and the fat, and then we if there is a yeah, starch, that's, that's brilliant. Then we move to the starch, and in order for my kids to go to the next level or whatever the next course, they clear their plate. They have to finish the first course. But here's the brilliant part, and this again, I have to thank Jessica for. We don't make a big deal about it. Mm -hmm. So if I put six pieces of broccoli on my daughter's plate, and she says, "I don't want any, I don't want broccoli," the response is, 
oh, you don't have to eat it. That's fine. And that's it. We don't talk about it. Yeah. And, and then we'll move on to the other. And she'll be like, what I want, I want that, <coughs> I want that meat or I want that pasta. And I'll say, well, you can't have that unless you you finish the first course because this is the right this is the right way to eat. But if you don't want to eat it, you don't have to. Leave it up to her. Right. It's her decision. And the reason why you do that is you want your kids, you want them, you want it to be their idea because yeah. it makes them feel more empowered. And and my regret in the past was I would force my kids. Right. I would literally say to them, if you don't eat that, you're grounded. Or you know, if you eat that, then I'd reward them with dessert. Like, okay, listen, if you finish all of that. Then you get to have the 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 pie that we made for after dinner. That's a that's a big regret <coughs> is using food as a punishment or as a reward mm-hmm, when mm-hmm. that alone will create you know bad bad relationships. Bad relationships right. Yeah, and then the more consistent you are with that process, it, it becomes less of a battle because they just expect it. Like, okay, well, this I I know that like not going past this is going to limit me from eating the other items. So. Were, were you thinking of other regrets or not? Because I just I just thought that was a great follow up yeah, because of what you were talking about, and I thought I bet I bet you both as parents have some regrets on the food piece because I doubt you were perfect ten years yeah, ago it's with just your kids using and you, food, and you probably it? see oh, how it how it's you know how now it unfolded, and you go fuck. I wish, I bro. Do you know how hard it is to erase some of those ingrained things? Like if my kids, like my daughter, like eating all of your plate. Oh, yeah. like my my daughter's the hard one when it comes mm-hmm. to food and you, like in the she doesn't want to eat in the morning do you know how hard it was for me to let her to go to school without eating breakfast mm-hmm. it was so hard where i actually would go to the store and buy different things that i think would taste good and i actually no joke I actually this i actually bought a sugary cereal so she would eat breakfast and jessica pointed it out she's like Is, are you really giving her that just so she'll eat she's like what's wrong if she doesn't eat breakfast and i'm like you know, I hear those words. I'm like, well, fuck. Yeah, you're right. I know. It's so weird because it's so ingrained, you know, that you don't you don't realize it. So those those are the big food food regrets that I have. As far as regrets and the other regrets I have with with <laughs> with my kids, you know what? Every single almost every time I ever lose my temper with my kids, I regret that I showed them that I lost my temper. Mm-hmm. Almost mm-hmm. every single time. It's it doesn't do anything but scare them. And I don't want my kids to do the right thing because they're scared. Right. I want them to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Yeah, because they want to. Because they want to. Right. And so I've done that where I've scared them because I lost my temper, mm-hmm. and then afterwards I'm like, oh man, <clears throat> I don't. I don't have a lot of regrets because I. I really feel like I. I have the ability to see the, kind of the silver lining and everything, and I don't re- repeat a lot of mistakes. Like mm-hmm. I make a lot of mistakes, hundred percent. Like I, I'm definitely uh, <laughs> far from perfect, and I do make a lot of mistakes but we talked about on a podcast recently uh, about this where you know i think there's i think somebody who continues to make the same mistakes over and over like there's some shit and there's some work you need to do inside of yourself because there's a pattern there that you're doing but yeah you know for the most part the things that i've done that have been big fuck ups or that have just devastated me or you learn from them i learned from them and they're in fact if they were really devastating or really bad it, it actually ended up being a really good lesson you know like that is like forever ingrained to me and i'll give you a, some, one that i think of right now that comes to mind that is probably a, a big regret i definitely learned from it so i don't know how much of this is a regret yeah, it's hard to look at it from that standpoint because if you didn't do those things, how the hell would you? Right. Yeah, but re- erasing that. Right. Like forgetting that. So, so something that I went through in my from about twenty to twenty five, I would say somewhere in that range, I I spent a lot of fucking money, and I spent a lot of money on not just myself but other people and friends, and a lot of that was driven by my my own insecurities, right? Because I was the kid who didn't have a lot of things growing up, uh, I reached a level of success. And it wasn't like I was rich. I was just a kid who was 20 years old making six figures. But for me, it felt like I was rich, you know, and I felt this need to feel that way. So I expressed it through buying people things and flying everybody everywhere and spending money in Vegas and tables and picking up $600 bar tabs and fancy restaurants all the time and, and always picking up the bill and taking care of that. And I really trained a lot of my friends for a long time to expect that. And it caused uh, a lot of, you know, issues with our friendships later on because later on I started to kind of, you know, resent them. And it took me a lot to own uh, own that it was my fault, that I was the one that trained them, you know, for they're all good friends of mine. They love me either way, but because of my insecurities of wanting to feel like the guy who had all the money all the time, 
I paid for everything. So sure, when we go do things, you know, late in my late twenties, we go somewhere. You know, my friends would kind of look over at me. Bill would come flying over, and everybody just like, you know, Adam's got it. He's always got money. You know, what I'm saying like he'll pay for it. And I remember at a point where I was like, man, what am I doing? Like this is like this is so wasteful mm-hmm. and not fair to me that I'm doing. It. But at the same time, too, I trained them to to do that because for years. I, I, I was feeding this insecurity by paying for all these people. And it took me years later to break that and to retrain that. I first had to accept that it was my fault and own that and then dig deeper into that insecurity of wanting to, you know, feel rich or look like I had all these things. And and then I had to first fix that. And then I also had to retrain my friends that, hey, regardless if I got the money to do it or not, like, motherfucker, you got to pay for your shit every now and then, you know what I'm saying? Or it's, we got to split this every now and then, bitch. I hated doing that stuff. I don't like that. There's nothing that bothers me more. You want people to ask. Yeah. Yeah. You want I, people to be like, no, 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 I'll got it. Got it. And right. it feels good. Like, okay, cool. Like, they yeah, appreciate yeah, yeah, that. Yes, totally. Yeah. So that was, you know, and again, back on me, if I had to try and pick a regret, that's the first thing that comes to mind that I think going back, I would have done things totally different. And because of that, I think I would have saved a lot of turmoil and hard conversations with my friends. I would have saved a lot of money. So that's probably the biggest regret that mm-hmm. I could think of. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm... I'm- Man, I'm really trying to think of something that like stands out completely, but because you made a good point about um, you doing all these things that ended up teaching you a life lesson that is even more valuable because I put myself out there and I risked my comfort level. And I feel like I am where I am be- today because of the the major risks I took in my life. And I can I can trace back to those major risks that have you know, some of them have failed miserably and some of them have, you know, thrived in, um, either way, like to me, the failed ones, I hold even more valuable just because for me, it it was, it, it just showed me how resilient, you know, I could be in the face of something not working out completely the way I wanted it to, but also just reevaluate. And I continually, reevaluate the process of how sometimes um, I, I basically replay it in my mind of how I could improve it. And so it's like, it's a real, it's a real experience that now I can, I can keep learning from it whenever I see that come up as a pattern. So if, for me to repeat the pattern would be, that would be devastating. Right? right. I definitely think there's, there are lessons, however, that you learn from a mistake that, perhaps somebody else also had to pay the price for. And those are the ones that I, I would be more likely to regret. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Like if I if I fuck up and I make a mistake and then I learn from it. And somebody I, else like got I can't, hurt from it. Yeah, I can't yeah. regret it. But if somebody else got hurt from it, like I said, when I get mad and yell at my kids. No, that's a great like, example. Yeah, it's yeah. like I learned from that for me, but fuck these, you know, these poor kids or whatever had to like pay the price for me learning yes. or making this mistake. No, it's, I agree. I think, I think parenting wise, of course, like I, I could totally figure find one of those moments you know where i felt like a total piece of shit you know because i just i i I wasn't um in in the right state of mind you know and i i lashed out or i said something that i wanted to take back um and you know i i know that i know that that's happened and i know that later on in life like your kids will come back and be like you know they'll they'll remember those moments and bring them up you know and Mm -hmm. That sucks. That sucks when you face that. But we're human beings, you know. Like, yeah. is this, if I'm not if I'm not checking that process and always thinking about that, like, and, and trying to improve upon that process, then you, you know, like, it's it, a it's a much more phil- philosophical question than you than you think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't. I don't because know if even, I do regret anything. Even the point that you bring up right there with like, because you 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 struck a chord for me right there with. Like, oh, shit, you know, what about situations that I've done where I, like, hurt somebody else, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Or, lot, like, for example, I, I lost a best friend over, uh, over a, you know, a situation, right? Like, we, we both were my buddy, my best friend at the time, and, and I was the best man in his wedding. And I, I have so much love, love for the guy. And, you know, we, there was a lot of stress that was surrounding the, the business that we are currently running. This was when I was doing the cannabis clubs. I was growing. He was... Uh, he was creating uh, wax and stuff like that. And we were doing all this stuff together and it was just super stressful time. And we kind of had a blow up 
And, you know, we forever went different directions and we haven't spoke since then. And I, I remember I, I wrote him like every month for a year because I, I was, he was such a close friend of mine. And I think like, fuck, you know, do I regret that conversation? Do I regret that big blow up and that fight? Do, or do I regret even going into that business with him and, and, and because I lost a best friend? And I think for a long time I might have regretted it, but when I really start to think about it now and and think about you know how we continue to evolve and grow and sometimes you outgrow relationships, you know I have to ask myself that you know potentially was that relationship heading down an unhealthy path and you know I don't know maybe it was and maybe really what happened was for the best you mm -hmm. know and so that's the. The philosophical side of me that's going it's like it's yeah. true because you're always going to think like well it's supposed to be that way right right so it's hard to regret something if yeah. you believe that things are you know the way that they're supposed to be well especially if you see the future getting better and better and better i i think that if if i were to make a decision that brought me and i started spiraling you know from mm -hmm. that decision and i wasn't able to pull myself out of it I would definitely regret that, you mm -hmm. know, that I chose that direction. Like if it was something where, uh, yeah, somebody like obviously got hurt or like I, you know, I had to, I had to pay the price for that and like, like basically dig myself out of something that was like well, that's totally how detrimental. I, that's why I asked you guys, you know, and I know you had to get up for a second, but that that's why I asked you guys that I thought it was a really cool that we followed this question up after the child thing, because you guys in a sense are seeing that play out right now some of the decisions maybe you made as parents that you might have thought was the right decision back then or you didn't even think at all Dude, about parent, it. Parenthood is a constant <laughs> constant stream of questioning yourself. Yes. Constantly. You're con and it's a, that's it is a hard game to play. You do play and it's okay and I understand why you do it as a, as a parent because you want to make sure you do a good job. But it's, if you get caught up in it, you get frozen by it because you will question every goddamn every yeah, damn well, thing you make. Every well, decision like you letting make. Letting them explore, like for instance, like you know, my kid like hurt himself falling off out of a tree. You know, like should I blame myself for not telling him to come down? Like I I struggled. No, with that. I think that's different, and there's yeah. lessons in that. I think more of like you know, did you guys put your kids on formula right away, or mm. did you allow them to eat ice cream and candy when yeah. they were two? Well, again, you know what I'm if, saying like, if, yeah. did you do things like yeah. that that you? Again, yeah. if you think that that things are the way they're supposed to be, then you you can't regret anything. But I will say this: one of the worst regrets you could ever possibly have, in my opinion, is the regret of not telling someone how you really feel about them before they're out of your life. Right. That I could see. I could see that. I could see that one being a tough one because now for me, luckily I've always been okay with expressing myself and I've lost a couple very close people to me, very, very close, but I never regretted not saying how I felt about them because you guys know me. You know, if I love somebody, I'm going to tell them, man, woman, whatever, I'm going to tell the person how much I care about them. And I'm glad I do because I have lost two people very close to me and there was never the, and I did look, one of them was a, a close family member. And after she was gone, you know, there were, I, I, there were definitely people that were like, God, I wish I told her how awesome she was to me or how much she really impacted me. And mm -hmm. that's a tough one. That is tough. That's a that's tough, tough one. To swallow, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, that's like, a good piece of advice. Yeah. Of if you tell the people around you that you care about, tell them how you feel. Because that feels good. There's nothing wrong with that. But not doing that and then having something potentially happen, that is a terrible position to be in. Good point. Yep. Next question is from Ron Palestre. What are your top three books that have impacted your lives the most in overall approach to philosophy, wealth, podcasting, etc.? Cool question. It is a cool question. Cool question. I can think of, uh, so I can think of one book and then I do a lot of my reading online. So, it's, so I, although I do read books, most of the reading I do has to, is, is stuff that I look up online or lectures that I'll find on YouTube. I love watching um, you know people speak, and I, t I think I learn better that way. At least I, 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 I move in that direction. But one book that um, really impacted me was, uh, and I can't remember the author, God is Not Great. Uh, can, maybe you can look that up, Doug, who, who wrote that book. But it's the, and I can't believe I can't remember his name because uh, he's like the the or God is not, I think it's God is not great. He's like one of the, the world's most prolific atheists, if I'm not mistaken. But I read that book already, uh, Richard Dawkins. Is that what it was? Yeah. How Religion Poisons Everything. So 
That's ironic that you chose that book. I'm yeah, gonna, I'm gonna yeah, the other direction yeah. Here. So, <laughs> so oh, Christopher Hitchens. I'm sorry, yeah. Christopher Hitchens. So this was years ago when I first read this book. Up until this point, I had become very, very skeptical and uh, of of religion. I had become very cynical of religion. My family, of course, being Catholic, I'd go to Catholic church on holidays and stuff like that. I'd look at all the ritual and the. And then when I visited the Vatican, I saw this opulence and. I just thought this is ridiculous, this is hypocritical, this is terrible, and I blamed uh, everything for on religion. I thought it was just silly. Why are pe- People believed in this shit because they didn't have science, they didn't understand how things worked, and so they'd make things up. And then I read this book, and it really solidified that for me, and I became an atheist, hardcore atheist. But when you become an atheist, when you're a real hardcore atheist, you actually question, you actually look at the question of God much deeper than someone who doesn't think about it at all. And most people, or a lot of people I know, don't even think of that question. They don't think of, is there a God? Like what? Like they, It's not a question they, they ponder over. But if you're an atheist, you've actually done a lot of thinking about it. You've actually sat down and thought and, and read and come up with this consensus. And so this book... Sometimes. This book got me to think, mm-hmm. well, you're right, but some people say they are. Yeah, some people are pretty ignorant. But, they're, but they may not be. They, they, they don't realize they're worshiping different gods. That's right. That's yeah. right. And so... This book brought, I became a hardcore atheist, but I start, and so I started talking about it more with people, debating people, and diving deeper. And this book pushed me then to, because of this book, I started learning more and more about science, and I started reading books on quantum physics. Quantum physics is fucking weird, very very weird. Watched a couple documentaries, did my own research, and I started to realize that we don't know at all much. We don't know much at all. In fact especially if you look at the, some of the weird, strange occurrences in quantum physics, kind of sounds like some of the stuff that people in, in religions and spiritual practices will preach. And so it brought me down this path where I went from atheism to being more agnostic to really diving into that question. And so this, that book actually moved me, in a, 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 not in the direction of atheism as, as much as it moved me in the direction of really examining that question and what that meant for me. And so it led me on a more spiritual path, I should say. So, and I know Christopher Hitchens, if you heard this, would be like, fuck. That was <laughs> the opposite. <laughs> that, was, that wasn't my yeah. goal. It wasn't his goal. That's why, so I, I have to counter that with, uh, it, it, if so top three for me is challenging. Top one is very easy for me. It's not even a close call. The Bible is by far mm. the most the most powerful read I have ever read in my life. And I know there's probably people that listen and then probably cringe at that. And that a lot of that, you, well, I challenge you to ask yourself, why do you cringe at that? A lot of people haven't read it who right. say that. Though. Exactly. Yeah. Very few people that... Because you can read it without... Without being going a, to church. Without being a religious person you, you or believer. Don't, you don't have to go to a church and belong to a congregation to read the most powerful book ever written. And I'll debate somebody all fucking day long on that. Because... Name name a topic, a subject that you want to learn about or you want advice in, and then I bet you money you can find it multiple times written about inside that book. The problem with it is that what man has done with just about anything is we've bastardized everything. We've taken something and we have manipulated it to create these congregations and dogma, and we've turned it into such an ugly, nasty thing that we've divided ourselves as a society of half the group of these people worship it and it's it's everything to them and then the other half of the people rebuke it and say it's awful and it, I would never read it it's like no you're talking about one of the best books ever written it's it, it's definitely the most read yeah. and that's a statistic that's real in the last 50 years uh they, someone did the statistics on this the last 50 years has been 3.9 billion copies sold hmm. in 50 years now obviously the bible's thousands of years old right, right. I mean, the way I look at it is this, and this is coming from someone who, again, was atheist, who's no longer atheist, but I'm, and I'm not specifically religious, but I'm definitely open to, you know, spirituality. The, there's ancient texts have a lot of wisdom. And, and the fact that the Bible, and there's other ancient texts, right, that are, that are widespread, but the Bible in, in particular, which is the, the most popular one, it, the reason why it's so popular and has spread so far, and it, people continue to read it even today, it's because there's a lot of wisdom in it, for okay. sure. It's, it's, there's a ton. Yeah, oh. so you don't have to be a religious person. You don't even have to believe in God well, to find some of the religion, it, I know no, it's, some of the wisdom. And I know we're all on the same thought process right now, so that was one of mine. But but at the same time, it's because I went through, I mean, my whole childhood was breaking down like the meaning and the purpose and 
um, you know, w- within Proverbs and, and, you know, all the different um, um, parables and, and different ways they explain things and just the communication that's in there. But, you know, for me, like I was very, I've always been a skeptic. And so even within that setting and that environment, I've felt uncomfortable. Like I've felt like the human element of it in the, um, the way that, um, the, you, you just see like different, um, different, different ways it's gone, different uh, interpretations, so, so many different directions. People yeah. like humans have taken it like the message and then, and then, um, sort of muddied the message. And so I've always been like very f- curious to find what the actual message was and like what, you know, if we were to get to the root of, of, of the message, which, you know, uh, people have used for power and mm-hmm. people have used to put people under uh, oppression and, so anyway, I, I've always had that and asked really hard questions, you know, to to preachers and to um, people within the faith to to you know to really analyze because I just don't like I want I always wanted empirical de- you know evidence. That's why I was into science. You know, like I really got into science because I could test things and and I could like um, figure things out tangibly of like okay mm-hmm. this equates to this and it's constant you know like math is, is it's it's a constant thing that i can rely on in this so anyway it brought me to this book it's it was called the the science of god and that was by gerald l schroeder i believe so. i've heard great things about that book i've never read it though. yeah so i have that in my house i've I read it multiple times but it's it's just a way that what what this author was trying to do was like realize that at one point science and religion you know, the, like they used to be, they the, were the one. great, the great thinkers <laughs> in the world started within the church. The church actually funded uh, scientific research uh, for a long time. Right. Funded a lot of the stuff. It, it divided, I think, because the powers that be within the church viewed it as a threat, especially when you had people saying things like, oh, the earth actually revolves around something else. Things don't revolve around us. Well, and like, if, yeah. And if things don't fit narratives, it's yeah. like, you just like, dismiss all like the mm-hmm. actual science instead of trying to interpret our world based off of like uh you know a create a creator in mind you know like there, there was this big division that had to happen all of a sudden so anyway my brain is always like well what did it you know what would the yeah. original message look like the, and why did why why did we like receive benefit from the it? the part for the, the that i find the wisdom in in that in the judeo-christian religion that i find so f- most fascinating is the radical notion, because people need to realize just how fucking radical the following idea is, or was when it first came out. It was the notion that there is sanctity in the individual because every individual had a soul. This is the, this is the teaching from the Judeo-Christian religion. Every person has a soul, and, all, and every all souls are a piece of God. We all have God within us. That was a radical notion because... During these periods of time, and way before that, kings and queens were, they were the fucking blessed ones. Everybody else was a peasant. Or if you had power, if you had money, then these people were less than. They were less than you. Well, here comes this belief system that says, no, we're all equal. We're, we're all equal in the eyes of God. We're all made in God's image or whatever. And that led to the, that led to the freedom. That led to free, to, to countries that valued the individual and mm-hmm. of course it didn't happen overnight it took time but we now see how successful that viewpoint is because if you don't believe that well then why would you why would you treat everybody the same it doesn't make any objective sense you would this guy has he can't offer me anything and i don't give a shit about him and you're a peasant and i'm rich and you're disabled or whatever like might as well kill you i'm in charge i'm the that was the belief system before people believe this underlying you know, this that came from something bigger than them that said, no, 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 we're all, we all have the, a God within us. So we all have to respect that, you know, and there, that sanctity, right, of, of the individual. So that's some brilliant, brilliant wisdom that was completely radical that came from that, that I will always respect, regardless of whether or not I believe in the, 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 you know, the, the, the metaphysical part of it or whatever. So we mm-hmm. all, we all picked a, you know, God type of book. For our- <laughs> Mine was an anti God, yeah, yeah, which, yeah, yeah. which is great though. No, I think that's uh, I think that's great. I think it's hands down. I think the one, when we get to books two and three is where there's going to be a lot of diversity amongst each of us, and I, even myself going through like my library of books and go like, man, which ones have been the most impactful? Mm-hmm. And I think that 
there, for, this is going to be so different for everybody. Like, so I'm going to name books that maybe may not be that impactful for you, but I think they represent a time in my life that, that when they came, that was so important for me to probably read that. Mm-hmm. And a, a book that I tend to recommend a lot to people. And again, it's selfishly for me because how it impacted me was uh, Developing the Leader Within by John C. Maxwell. And that sent me down a rabbit hole of like, I read like almost all of his books. I've read a ton of his books and he's got a bajillion of them. Um, because I, I'd, I had fallen in love with the style of his writing and, and the message behind it. And I, he does like the way he writes, he writes in these short stories. And for a guy like me who, who had a, a hard time reading books and staying focused on, on the, in the book, and I would trail off a lot, my thoughts, it, he really started, he's, his, his way of writing is what really gave me that thirst to read and grow more. So it was very impactful. And then, of course, to read a book like Developing the Leader Within, uh, much of those principles are within that book. And he, the way he writes, he writes in these short stories. So a chapter is only you know five to 10 pages sometimes. And so I can be engulfed in a short story really, really quick and, and easily and not be distracted. Mm. And, and I, I would digest a lot to that. So that was a extremely impactful uh, mm. book for me. Yeah. For me, the, the next, the next ones are, weren't books. Now I did read books by these individuals, but it wasn't the books that impacted me the strongest. So the, the next thing for me was I do a lot of learning through watching lectures and there was a talk. Uh, this was years ago that uh, Ron Paul, gave on uh, to Congress and it was a talk about God, I almost forgot his fed up book that was a yeah, great book yeah he he, t- he did a talk on you know terrorism and and how would we feel if our we were being bombed and would we become terrorists and mm-hmm. you know and he did this whole talk on it and it blew me the fuck away like I listened mm-hmm. to this man I'm like oh sh-. I never thought of things in that way and I went down the rabbit hole of Ron Paul and watching his his talks and what he says about freedom, what he says about, you know, uh, our foreign policy of, you know, invading other nations and all this other stuff. And it led me down a path that really, you know, shaped me to kind of who I am. Because of Ron Paul, I started reading uh, about economics. I started reading, uh, you know, people about Austrian economics versus Keynesian, uh, Keynesian economics. I started, I read um, Mises and, you know, Hayek, um, which then led me to the, I'll give my third person real quick, which was Milton Friedman. And Milton Friedman has a series on YouTube called Free to Choose. It's an old series. It was filmed in, in, I think, 1979 or 1980. Absolutely brilliant. And I like that it's old because all of the predictions he made in some of these videos about what's going to happen if we don't change course, totally true. So watching that was like watching a pro- like a dude prophesize what's about to happen. Right. And then a lot of it happening and going, oh, shit. And Milton Friedman has been a huge impact on me. Um, you know, just in terms of understanding how, you know, human behavior and markets, or at least how e- economics is kind of what drives, uh, you know, peace and prosperity in the world. So those are my, that's always my third one. Yeah. I just, I think for me, less on, on, on books and just more on, um, just initial storylines that, uh, I helped me to think deeper and, um, I, I've gone, I, th- I think for me, like what really changed was just like kind of getting diving deep into like philosophy and, and philosophers. And I, I took a couple courses uh, in college that really challenged my way of thinking, like really diving into Socrates and Plato and St. Augustine and um, just understanding the freedom to explore, um, you know, your own thought process and, and understand the world around you without, um, subscribing to, um, somebody else's like already uh, laid out thought process. And so like, that's, I've used that, um, in everything I've, I've, I've done going forward. It's just like, I have to, it's like question everything, you know, it's like, is, is what you believe really what you believe and, and being an an individual, what is that, look like for me it was was leaving my comfort zone and going to to chicago and um understanding who i was as a person and like uh, i've i've been hammered growing up my whole life to live a certain way be a certain type of person subscribe to a certain thought process you know like follow these rules and um just knowing that there was brilliant minds uh in the past that 
collectively would challenge each other and would think about the bigger things like why why do we even exist you know like what what is our purpose what like i I just can't i can't pull away from that that's always something that i come back to well i think all the stoics are awesome i think that's a uh, it's and it's hard for me to pinpoint just one book uh, right because i could say something about aristotle you know like i've read books on him and, and socrates and um i always get something out of that just because i just love i love hearing people challenge um common thought uh, I, so I, I'm, I'm going to give you guys one that I think is kind of cool to, or pertains to, um, maybe my philosophy now and how that's changed. So just recently, and like since mind pump has started, cause I could go all day long about all these different books that I think have impacted me in different ways. And that I think they all have in a, in a sense. Right. Mm-hmm. But I think it'll be cool to tell you guys something that I think is really, and, and I think the guys are going to really piggyback off of this or agree with me. Um, Rise of Superman and Stealing Fire mm-hmm. uh, were very enjoyable books for me, and they also really changed um, how we do certain things as a, as a group and then how I do things as an individual now. Uh, because before that, I was just not familiar with flow state. I just had never really used anyone, heard anyone use that term, and even if I did, I d- it didn't register on what that was. It Was it a real thing? Was it just a term that people were making up? Can you actually train to be in flow state? Can you actually do things to promote this state that people talk about? And the book does a really good job of uh, introducing that to somebody like me who is just not familiar with what flow state is. And I took so many things from those books that we now apply within Mind Pump. I, uh, there's there's mm-hmm. these these little rituals that we all kind of do. And when you really unpack these things, like what we're doing is we're, we've, we have found things that promote this group flow and that provides one, either one, a better show or two, a better product or three, you know, a, a better program. Like, so, and, and I've been able to, to apply it to many things that I do, even like something as simple as walking into a conversation with my partner and making sure that I, I, I do the work to mentally prep myself to go into those conversations, make a huge difference. Or before I go into an interview where someone's interviewing or a big conversation that I have to have with, uh, with another, you know, maybe a sponsorship or another person that we're trying to do business with or negotiating something like I've learned, I took some of the principles from that book and I've now applied it to my life and man, it's, it's really paid dividends. So, you know, as many books that I could list off that I think have been impactful, that one is something currently that I think has personally impacted me and probably impacted the boys. And it's something that I think that we continue are developing and really the roots of that information and knowledge came from those two books that, I, you know, maybe, Agreed. I, right. Wouldn't Agreed. you say, wouldn't you say so? Absolutely. I, mean, I, I think it's something that we all really appreciate yep. and, and, and try. I think we all, we all engaged in, in figuring out how to go into flow without even realizing that. Yeah. We right. We kind of, we kind of, but like, it's nice. Cause it makes you realize like, okay, that's why we end up going off a, on a trip. That's why we end up doing that ritual of the process because it puts us in that state. Now we can, we have a name for it. We can identify it and we can value it so we can Respect it differently. Yeah. No, Excellent. Uh, I think so. So check this out. We have a bunch of free guides. Uh, we have a guide that teaches you how to train your arms, your core. We have a guide on leg training, chest training, a guide on how to do hit training properly, and more. Uh, they're absolutely free. They cost nothing. Just go to mindpumpfree.com and get one of them for yourself. We had to cut that short because Justin's only read two books. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now, plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. 
If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump. <laughs>